Welcome in. The base is dropped. Another edition of Soccer Down here. It's a Friday. It's May 29th. There's a lot of stuff going on uh, in the soccer world, and we're going to try to give you guys, uh, at least here in the United States, a distraction from uh, other stuff going on for at least a little while. Uh, Mike Conti is going to join us at 10 o'clock. We will get caught up on everything MLS related and WSL related. We got a lot of stuff going on around the world. Uh, a lot of restart dates for leagues. A lot of conversation about what those restarts look like. Uh, the latest that I'm seeing come across, like in the last few minutes, is the J League in Japan. July 4th is their restart date. Uh, La Liga still moving forward with June 11th. Serie A. June 20th with the Coppa Italia possibly starting the week before that, although that's in dispute now. Um, It's all starting to get back to normal. Even some countries are talking about fans in the stands. We mentioned Hungary. Uh, Russia is looking like they're going to move forward with a very small number of fans in the stands. Poland and others are, are starting to edge in that direction. So lots of things to catch up on. Um, probably a lot of questions about England, and let's start there, John. We've got the FA Cup with tentative dates going forward, and there were a lot of questions on if they'd be able to fit the FA Cup dates into the compressed schedule that they're looking at, and the FA has come up with some dates that they think might work. Restart uh, June 27. Dates confirmed for the rest of the season. Quarterfinal semi split across weekends in June and July. And you're looking at the final fixed for August 1st. So that's the uh, the early rundown of that. You're looking at, after the resumption of the Premier League yesterday, the quarterfinals. There are four. Thus, quarterfinals. I know that stuns folks. Leicester City, Crazy. Chelsea, Newcastle, Manchester City, Sheffield United, Arsenal, Norwich, and Manchester United played over the weekend of June 27th and 28th. And so that'll get things started where the final eights of the FA Cup are concerned. So on the league side, uh, because that needed to get nailed down first, we we mentioned June 17th as the two games in hand getting played before the next full round of fixtures starts. Uh, Potentially a match on June 19th. I don't know if that is confirmed as of yet. Uh, Some are saying it is. Some are saying it isn't. The rest are going to be Saturday, June 20th, June 21st, and you're going to have games staggered. So the idea is to not have more than one game going on at a time for TV purposes. After that, uh, do we know when the season would be set to end? Has that been confirmed as of yet? Have not seen any confirmation on the ending of the season. Okay, because that's going to affect the viability of the the FA Cup dates. Um, I do believe it was set to end before August first, before the final. I wa- actually want to say the weekend before that, but I might be incorrect on that. We'll see if we can get some some further information there. Venues, times, all that stuff is still up in the air with the FA Cup. All right, the matches that could be not played in their home venues and there are some uh, a couple different reports on this matt lawton and martin ziegler at the times said 12 about 12 high risk matches could be played in neutral grounds all liverpool home games are, are looked at that uh, they are very concerned about celebrations of Liverpool's first Premier League title outside of Anfield, and they're trying to do everything to avoid that. Also, if the season is curtailed, and this was part of the eight-hour-plus meeting yesterday, unweighted points per game, so just a flat points per game, would be used to decide the table. And that broadcast rebate we've talked about that Liverpool and a number of the other top clubs were were fighting because it would affect them uh, more than it would others, looks like it's been cut in half to $170 million in total. So you're looking at 
uh, exposure for the top six teams at around 15 million pounds and for the bottom 14 teams around five, six million pounds. Um, Ian Herbert followed up on the high risk fixtures on Twitter and, and he understands that police have identified six fixtures that will require neutral venues. Manchester City versus Liverpool, Manchester City versus Newcastle, Manchester United versus Sheffield United, Newcastle versus Liverpool, Everton versus Liverpool, the game in which Liverpool might win the title. Um, As of yet, the Premier League's 13 police force areas have named no fixtures of concerns relating to relegation-threatened sides, but that could be addressed later. That could be added depending on, on how this thing looks. Uh, that's going to be an issue, and it's going to be an issue in England that Germany's been able to avoid it. Uh, we'll have to see how Spain and Italy handle this possibility. I think it's it's been far too quiet on the club side on, on dealing with this. I think we've only heard so far Manchester United say anything about it. Uh, other clubs need to, especially Liverpool. I mean, you've got to get out in front of this. And, and as we've seen, you know, Jurgen Klopp is a, a person who – can absolutely inspire the the Liverpool fan base, their supporters, and he has not been shy in doing that, not been shy in, in being very vocal. Uh, at the very beginning of, of all of this with the coronavirus, he was very outspoken and very uh, public uh, about saying what he thought should happen and what didn't need to happen, et cetera, et cetera. I, I hope that Liverpool uses him as a voice of reason in this, and I think it's something that you want to embrace as well. I'm, I'm a little surprised it hasn't happened yet, unless there's just the idea that we're not going to play games at Anfield because we don't think it's safe. Newcastle right now 13th in the table. They're the lowest side to be involved in a match at a neutral venue. And remember when all of this discussion started, uh, you had Brighton. They, they came out and there were uh, one of the teams – about for a very specific, different reason, right. though. We've got that clear. They're yes. talking about it from losing home field advantage in a relegation scrap. That has right. nothing to do with the Liverpool situation. Brighton also is using a lot of their complaints for self-interest. I think that's kind of obvious. Yes. So that's why Ian Herbert said right now there's no fixtures of concern related to relegation threatened sides, and he said that could prevent repeat of neutral venues row. Um, a row, I guess maybe is the proper way to say that in the UK. Uh, it could come up. It absolutely could come up. But Brighton's not saying that out of a safety issue. We all know that. Let's not let's not give them the benefit of the doubt there. We know why Brighton said what they said earlier on. They thought that playing games at home would give them an advantage. It doesn't. Germany's shown that. They also, I think, thought that the more they pushed back on all of this, that maybe games don't get played, and maybe that's how they save their skins. Uh, self-interest, and it was kind of awful to see, and I, they don't get any credit for that in my book. The uh, June the 4th is the next date that is where the discussions on this will pick up. No matches in the championship have been discussed as a part of the, the neutral site discussion yet, but... Don't be surprised as this continues That was to actually evolve. mentioned by Matt Lawton uh, on, or I think Martin Ziegler, sorry, on Twitter as a follow up to the article. Uh, high risk games in a championship could be played at neutral grounds. He said the decision would be by club, local safety advisory group, and police. Leeds and West Brom are the ones that would be most likely affected there. Yep. So keep an eye on that as we get toward the, the notion of. The, the end of the schedule and what Leeds and West Brom would like to think of as inevitable promotion to the Premier League. Uh, something that came up yesterday, even ESPN talked about it uh, on Around the Horn. It, it came up from Didier Deschamps' quotes, and they were pulled way out of context uh, on Around the Horn. And, and Suzanne Rack at The Guardian, I think, provides more context into this decision about how the women's game is not coming back in England um, while it is in Germany, which I think was left out of the discussion on the round the horn. And it is here. 
uh, the question was about why is it not safe for the women to play and safe for the Premier League to play? The answer is money, according to who was it who who said that on Around the Horn? Jackie McMullen. Jackie McMullen said it. Um, she's not a soccer person, so I mean that needs to be understood here. But money does play a role in this. There, there's no question about that, and, and that needs to be understood. But there's no issues with safety for one and not safe for another that's not the problem it is money but there's some very specific conversations that need to happen about the money and Suzanne Rack nailed it with the Guardian highly recommend her article Um, she talked about Germany she talked about the NWSL as part of it but she talked about England let's start with the German portion of it because that is something that's very important today actually right now the Frauen Bundesliga is back underway the women's first division in Germany is playing as we speak. Uh, Derek Ray has tweeted out um, live access if you want to watch. Now, here's the reality in Germany that they faced and they handled in the way that they did. Uh, the Deutsche Fußball Liga, which is the DFL, which oversees the, the leagues, they were said at the beginning of this, if you didn't come back, you're looking at a 770 million euro loss. We've talked about that. Matches played behind clo- closed doors. Clubs are going to lose 91 million euro in match day revenue. No way around that right now. Last season, match day revenue accounted for only 12.9% of Germany's across all the leagues. I'm assuming that's not just the Bundesliga, that's across everybody. Their total income. Now, obviously, the Bundesliga match day revenue could be more because you're playing in bigger venues, but you also have more TV money to offset it. Lower divisions and the Frauen Bundesliga, you need the match day revenue because you don't have the TV money to offset it as much. Uh, so far, what we know in Germany, and this is from Suzanne Rack at The Guardian, Werder Bremen have taken out a loan from a state owned bank. Uh, We talked about kicker facing or reporting that 13 of 36 teams in the top two divisions were facing insolvency. And as, as Rack says, yet when discussing recovery, clubs dug deep. And this was very early in this process. I want to say at the end of March, if not at the beginning of April. Bayern Munich, Borussia Dortmund, Leipzig, Bayer Leverkusen all contributed 7.5 million euro while also giving up. 12.5 12.5 million euro in TV rights payments to build a 20 million euro solidarity fund for the whole of German professional football, benefiting the third division clubs and the Frauen Bundesliga clubs. The clubs that had a parent team in the men's Bundesliga or second division waived their share of the solidarity fund. That, that had been reported a little bit differently earlier on. So four top clubs... And four, well, it's four top clubs who did it, period. Four top clubs contributed money out of their pocket, also gave up TV rights money to create a solidarity fund that is helping the Frauen Bundesliga play right now, period. You want to know why it's happening? That's why. Four clubs looked at things that were bigger than them, didn't look at self-interest, didn't look at that stuff, and actually did this for the good of the game. Not just the Frauen Bundesliga, but the third division on the men as well. Four clubs came together and created a solidarity fund of 20 million euro. Not everybody, four. It's massive. Uh, Fritz Keller, the president of the, the DFB, the Federation in Germany, said, we can only overcome this crisis together when we act as one because there is only one football. The Bundesliga clubs exemplify this cohesion in a brilliant manner with their financial support. It shows that we are fighting together for the good of our football and that we won't give up on any club. What happened here in the United States with the NWSL? It's a different setup entirely. But Delroy Hansen has come out of pocket. He's offered teams the use of his planes, which it's nice to have some planes. He's got some. He's making them available for people. I've seen people take shots at Delroy Hansen for having planes. Like, who cares right now? Delroy Hansen is making planes available to teams who need them to travel. He's making accommodations available for teams. He's making venues available for teams. And what has all that done? It's allowed the league to play games this year when they might not play anymore. It's allowed the league to bring in new sponsorship that it didn't have before. Point all the fingers you want at Delroy Hansen for being a coin collector. 
But Del Loy Hansen has stepped up. You want to know who didn't step up? The Premier League. The FA. And a lot of people point to the FA. You need to look at the big clubs in the Premier League who didn't step up. You need to look at the big clubs in the Premier League who don't treat their women's teams the right way. Others do. They don't. That's their choice. That's why the Women's Super League isn't playing right now. Period. The Women's Super League in England, you're talking about for the most part, clubs that are part of major clubs in the game. That's what you're talking about. You're not talking about independent teams. You're not talking about the NWSL situation. You're talking about clubs that are major clubs. It's not about safety, why they're not coming back. It is about cost because it's very expensive to come back and play. And when you don't have gate revenue to match up with it, you don't have money. That's understood. Does Arsenal have money? Does Chelsea have money? Does Liverpool have money? Does Manchester City have money? Does Manchester United have money? Does Tottenham have money? I'm leaving a few out because they might have less money. Those clubs could fund the Women's Super League finishing their season if they chose to. Period. That's the reality. That's what's going on. It's not about safety and stop throwing all these other questions into it. It is the fact that Germany did it one way for the good of the game and others don't want to do that. That's their choice. But that's the reality. Suzanne wrote this at The Guardian towards the end, and and this is important. In England, the question put to professional football outside the Premier League is, can you afford to resume? The answer in the case of the Women's Super League and the Women's Championship was no. There is no solidarity fund to assist with losses, let alone cover the costs of return of restarting. The notion that you should help clubs equitably rather than equally by financially assisting struggling clubs and not those with wealthy parent operations on the assumption that it is good for the long-term health of the game is seen as idealistic. In Germany and the U.S., governing bodies are showing that if you are bold, women's football does not have to be a casualty of this crisis. Instead, it can be a pioneer. The, the understanding needs to be of why they didn't want to do this. They didn't want to pay the money. That's it. They didn't want to pay for the testing for the women's Super League teams. They didn't want to pay for the additional protocols that are going to be needed to make it safe for people. They chose not to do that. And when you look at the makeup of the FA Women's Super League, not even getting into the championship, because the second division in Germany in the women's game is not coming back, just the top flight. Birmingham City, a little bit different conversation. Brighton, a little bit different conversation. Bristol City, different conversation. Reading, West Ham, we can put those in a different conversation. Arsenal, Chelsea, Everton, Liverpool, Manchester City, Manchester United, Tottenham. You could have created a solidarity fund for the women's game and had the Women's Super League finish if you wanted to pay the bills. That's it. Those clubs can pay the bills. That's that's a known fact. Those clubs could pay the bills. Are they going to lose money right now? 100% they are. There's no way around that. Are the, the top four clubs in Germany that can created a solidarity fund, are they going to lose money right now? Yep. Dortmund, the, the number that had been out there before was 2.4, 2.5 million euro per home game they have without fans. And that might be on the low side. That was That's out there. They're losing money by playing these games. They also lost money by putting it into a solidarity fund, but they did that to grow the game, and they did that because they see a value in the women's game. And the third division men's game, let's, let's, it's not just a women's thing here. It, that's, that's what, honestly, I take even you know more, more of an impressive feeling about because it's not even just trying to do it for one group. It's trying to do it for all of football that needs some help right now. And while you have the Premier League arguing about things like Brighton saying we can't play in a home venue, we can't play in a neutral venue, we can't play when you've got all the the nonsense with the lower divisions, when you've got all of the just back and forth nonsense that's going on right now, and it's, it's kept the women's game from coming back, it could end up not causing lower division teams to go out of business because look lower division teams some of them have made their own mistakes and that's why they are in the situation they are but they could be helped if some of these bigger clubs wanted to 
And they don't. Flat out. They don't. Um, wasn't like this German Solidarity Fund was hidden. We talked about it a long time ago. People have seen it. You've seen the way that you can do this. And if you don't want to, then you don't want to. And, and that's that's on you. In some ways, not ultimately, because, hey, these clubs that failed, if they do, and probably when they do is the better way to put it, they do share a lot of blame in this. Um, they put themselves in a situation they couldn't survive this. This is also something that they could not have foreseen. And for the good of the game, the bigger clubs should be doing more. Flat out. They should. And that's why you don't have the Women's Super League coming back. People... In Germany, saw that the women's game and the third division men's game was important, and they created a solidarity fund to support that. Here in the U.S. with the NWSL, which is a completely different situation, you have Delroy Hansen and others, because uh, the owners are, are moving forward to do this, you have people committed to doing it. Is it going to cost them? Yep. Are they going to make money at it? Probably not, even with the sponsorship help for the NWSL. I don't think they're going to make money on all of the salaries that they're paying out for the year, even if they don't play anymore, and even for players who don't feel comfortable coming back to play right now. Are they going to lose money? Yeah. Everybody is right now. But people have stepped up for the good of the women's game, for the good of the grassroots game, for the good of smaller clubs. There's a lot of people who could learn a lot from that. Uh, Major League Baseball, the Premier League, a lot of different countries around the world right now could learn a lot from that and we'll see if they do yeah a bottom line at the end of the rack article you can be a pioneer for the women's game you're seeing what germany is doing you're seeing what the united states is doing you're seeing what england is not doing and liverpool's women's team is wondering whether or not they're going to be relegated right now and you've seen the lack of investment from liverpool they were more than happy to sit there and say, yeah, go ahead and kill the season. It's just it's incredibly disappointing that a team that has so much stake in the world game is literally just basically tossing the, the women's team off to the side. It's, it's very, very frustrating. And, and England's approach in this situation on the whole is very frustrating too. Go back and read some of how Liverpool's women's team was – treated on the their trip to the u.s last year there was a lot made about liverpool bringing their women's team over for that which was a very good thing to do they didn't have to they didn't really handle it all that well um these these clubs need to because look at the end of the day these clubs are businesses and they're trying to make money we know that the clubs that created the solidarity fund in germany are not making money off of that they did it because it's for the good of the game um other decisions. Della Hansen is looking at the Utah Royals and the NWSL playing right now as, yeah, long-term investment. That's that's a fact. Um, these clubs in the Premier League should be looking at it the same way because the business is there. You can't deny it anymore. You looked at the numbers last year during the World Cup. If you want to argue that Go ahead, but tell me when you you untie yourself from the mental gymnastics of it, why the U.S. women, and look, I know we've talked about that, that legal case. We've talked about the equal pay thing. I think they really need to sit down and sort this out because so many different things have gotten messed up with it. But now, because the numbers are out there, you can't argue that the women's team doesn't make money. They do do they made more over the last four years than the men's team did they bring in this revenue as well these things are real in the united states the women's game is pretty close to the men's game in terms of revenue is it the same probably not mls is growing faster than the nwsl is and that's 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 the reality of the professional sports landscape we live in that doesn't mean there is not a business value in women's soccer. I think it's clear that there is. So even beyond doing something that is good here, like the German clubs did, a solidarity fund that is a good thing to do, there's a 
business component to it. The Women's Super League has grown dramatically to the point that Chelsea paid a lot of money to bring in Sam Kerr and paid her a lot of money to wear their shirt. That doesn't happen just because it's a nice thing. That happens because it's an investment. The, these clubs would benefit from the investment in the women's game. They would. I think we're seeing that happen. And right now, things have changed. The women's game is the one that is at most risk. If you want to compare it to something here, it's like the non-revenue sports at a major college program. Because, no, it's not bringing in a ton of money at the moment. The If you want to compare what the Liverpool women's team makes to what the Liverpool men's team makes, yeah, it's nowhere close. It's not even in the same remote ballpark. It's like comparing you know, the equestrian team at Georgia to what Georgia football brings in. It's not the same thing. But now at a time where you're going to need to help and need to step up, are you going to keep that team that has value and brings value to your overall brand and will grow into a not a loss leader, a program that can make you some money. I don't know if Equestrian is ever going to turn into something that makes money. I think women's professional soccer in England and in other parts of the world can make money. Is it going to make as much as the men? Not anytime soon. And that's not because it's not a good product. That's just the reality of the sports business that we are in. But can it be a moneymaker? Yeah. Is it the right thing to do right now to support a factor of the game that needs it? Yeah. And the fact that these clubs are arguing over rebates and, and this and that and all kinds of nonsense and not supporting the, the women's team, it's it's disappointing. It's very disappointing when you see others finding a way to do it and they're just choosing not to because it would be a cost. And that's why it's not coming back. No other reason. When... You and I and our listeners were growing up in college basketball. We got to see traditional non-revenue sports in women's hoops in Knoxville, Tennessee, and in Stores, Connecticut. They were holding their own weight because success and investment bred more success and more investment. There were times in stores and there were times in stores where they have to play in Hartford. They have to play in other places because a lot of folks want to go see UConn women's hoops. At the University of Tennessee in Pat Summit's heyday, there were more people watching women's basketball than women's basketball. And UTK and the Lady Vols, they had their own branding. They had more folks in the seats. They were They were paying their own freight. If Katie Weaver's favorite phone provider and her favorite Annie Persprint didn't see value in the women's game here in the United States, they would not have invested in what we're going to be seeing in Utah. I think that, and I would like to think, I'd like to hope, that you're going to see other investors, other sponsors, other possible sponsors, other businesses sit there and see what you're going to see in that tournament, understand its importance, but also understand that it is a business opportunity for them to expand their growth. Bottom line for me. And it's and like I said, I will continue to hammer this home as many times as it comes up on the show. You want a growth opportunity right now in the United States as a business owner and as someone who could sponsor something. It's women's soccer at the NWSL. I think the NWSL can continue to make those strides, continue their successes, continue to grow the game, and really sit there and have folks look at their bottom lines over the next handful of years and sit there and go, man, we made a fantastic investment, A, and we also grew the game. I, I don't I don't know if the comparison with with women's hoops and, and women's soccer is even valid because I, I don't know if women's hoops will ever be the type of money maker that women's soccer could be. We have seen it with a World Cup. 
we've seen it with how the World Cup has grown. We've seen it with tens of thousands of people in stadiums for these games, and we've seen the quality of the game grow. I, I think women's soccer has a very unique opportunity to mm -hmm. lead the way for women's professional team sport, and and it's it's not even on the same plane as what's happened in college basketball because I don't think even those programs necessarily make the kind of money that top women's teams are in in soccer are doing now from a professional standpoint it's it's a big deal um and it's just down to the fact of, of what you want to do at this point because I, again i don't like to tell people how to spend their money um i'm not a fan of of pointing fingers at owners of teams uh who have a lot of money a lot more money than i do and point fingers at them just because they have money and just because they don't spend it in the way that I would like them to. It's not my money. But you can't really argue it very well here when you see what others are doing to get the women's game back on the field and what's happening here. Now, there is a question, and, and this did come up with the Women's Super League conversation to a degree, about would the players have agreed to come back? Um, in the NWSL and the, the Frauen Bundesliga, they did, and they were apprised of all of the different safety issues that were coming up, all the different protocols that were being put in place to keep them safe. I don't know if it ever got to those conversations in the Women's Super League. I don't know if there was ever any serious thought about them coming back. But these clubs could benefit from the investment is what it comes down to, and they're choosing not to. They're making that choice at a time where they're losing money, and that's why it's it's hard to sit here and and say like you're doing this wrong. I think you're missing an opportunity. I think you're missing a huge opportunity, and and you just need to be upfront about it. And that's I think something we tried to talk about with this game right now and sports as a whole right now because it feels like it's been left out of the the shuffle too often. Clubs, teams, organizations, everybody in sports who has anything to do with a live event business is losing money right now, period. Um, that's going to force some difficult decisions. It's going to force cuts. It's going to force things to change. That's just the reality of the sporting landscape. You know, I am not going to sit here and tell you that when they come back on the field, that MLS will be just fine. No, it's going to be hard. NWSL, it's going to be hard. USL Championship, it's going to be hard. National teams, when they start to play, it's going to be hard. Youth clubs, when they start to play, it's going to be hard. Like Things are different. It's just a fact. And you've got to pick, I think, right the, the, the right investments, the smart investments, the smart things to spend money on right now. And you've also got to think a little bit harder about you know what's what you should be doing and what you shouldn't be doing at this point. I think you need to get down to the basics and get down to what's important. And in my opinion, in soccer, the women's game is incredibly important. Uh, there's a lot of things in soccer that I worry about how they're going to handle this. The women's game, the grassroots game, the nonprofit world that, that lives to, to try to you know provide the game in underserved areas. All those things take money to make them happen and all those things are at risk of being able to do the things that they've done because money's not going to be as plentiful going forward in the game these things are facts so i i get a little frustrated when i see these things and thank you to the the four clubs in germany that created a solidarity fund for the good of the game um i don't know if mls is in a position to do that i don't know if the u.s soccer federation's in a position to do that they're both staring at, at huge losses I do hope they find ways to contribute to aspects of the game that they can and, and want to support and can support with whatever they can support it with. That That's what I hope. It's not about cutting a certain kind of check. It's not about you know putting yourself and your core business at risk that these things are not smart. But it's about being a leader in the space. And the Bundesliga has done that. The The top clubs in the Bundesliga have done that. I think the top clubs in England have not. I think the top clubs in some other parts of the world have not. I think here, Deloy Hansen ha has stepped up the leadership with the NWSL, uh, new commissioner, Lisa Baird, coming into this and, and figuring it out on the fly. You have to give her a ton of credit. 
And I think Don Garber has done good work in figuring this out. I think he has tried to keep everything moving forward with MLS. I think they've done some great work with their MLS works programming and supporting clubs who are doing great things in the community during this. I hope they can continue to do that and do even more because MLS has that kind of effect and has that kind of value in the game in this country. So we will see, we will see where it goes, but I I saw that tweet come through from around the horn yesterday and it, it took things out of context and and it was a, a quick, you know, little blurb from Jackie McMullen that, that didn't provide all the proper context and I wanted to get into that this morning because it's very simple why the Women's Super League's not coming back. And, and Didier Deschamps' quotes, I don't think, were completely going down this road. I think he was trying to justify France's decision not to play, period, which was not about trying to point out you know, inequity in, in other countries. But this is a complicated issue. But it does come down to money. But it's not the way that they're talking about you can, as we've seen, I think, create a safe way for games to be played. I think we have enough of a track record to show that. Is it what it was before? No, it's not. You have to do a lot of things that we're not used to. You have to play behind closed doors at the moment. You have to do a lot of testing to make sure it's safe. These are all factors to make it safe. But as we've seen with now three rounds of the Bundesliga, it can be done. As we're hopefully going to see with other countries, it can be done. So it can be safe. People, and I think Didier Deschamps, and this is where I I think if you just saw the quotes from Didier Deschamps, you haven't been following the whole situation, you, you say that, you know, oh, they're risking safety to come back because of money. No, they're coming back because of money. That, duh. That's that's why businesses want to open right now. That's why everything is pushing forward the way it is. Yes, cash rules everything around me. We know this. There's nothing wrong with that. But you have to do it safely to do that. And I think you're showing that you can. The issue with the Women's Super League was not about safety. It is about money, but it's a, it's in a different way than they were talking about. It's about clubs choosing not to spend that money on programs that are probably not making money right now, but programs that right before this, they were looking at as investment areas to grow their clubs. That's why this is a complicated situation. We will see. We will see what they do going forward. We will see what soccer in this country does to deal with it. I I don't think you have a whole lot of folks that are in the position that Bayern Munich and and Dortmund and Leipzig and Bayer Leverkusen were in to create a solidarity fund. Uh, I don't know what that's going to look like here, but clubs, leagues, leaders in the game do have voices. They do have resources, even if they're not financial, that they can use to help grow the game and specifically highlight and spotlight areas of the game that are going to need that support. And I hope that we do that in this country. Kitty Weaver's in this morning. She says, uh, after laughing, not one, but two weird shout outs for secret on SDH. Seriously though, she really appreciates uh, our support of women's sports. Happy to see Germany come together to support. And then she wonders if the lack of support for it in England is due to owners from countries, not historically supportive of women's rights. Um, when you look at those teams, I mean, I think you've got all aspects of, of ownership, so I don't know if it's that simple. Um, you know, I mean, Liverpool, we know what their ownership is. Uh, that wouldn't come into play there in the same way that it might from other countries and other ownership groups, but I don't think that's it. I, I think it is, is honestly just down to not wanting to absorb the cost because look the cost to to finish the season and I don't know off the top of my head how many rounds they had I think it's it's comparable to what other you know smaller divisions are facing you're you're talking you know 8 9 rounds of play and it's going to cost you anywhere between 150 and 200,000 euro or pounds you know you're you're talking a lot of money to finish the season out to get it done and you're going to lose money every time you play a game that these things are real like that does factor into it so i get it but they're making the choice not to spend that money in some of these clubs because they have the money to spend they could do it they are opting not to 
And if that is to secure the long-term future of the club, which includes the women's game, okay. If that's what they have to do in the short term, uh, okay. I wish it wasn't. I I wish they would find a way like Germany did. I wish they would find a way like Delroy Hansen and the NWSL did. But if they can't, they can't. We'll see what they do going forward. We'll see what they do when the next season's supposed to start. Because I don't think it's going to start with fans in the stands. I don't think it's going to start without the amount of testing that is needed. I don't think September is, is going to be a situation where we're not doing two tests a week minimum. I don't think it's going to be a situation where you know we have tickets being sold, uh, at least in large numbers. I don't think those things are going to happen. So is the women's game going to come back then? Is it? That's what I want to see. You know, And I think we'll, we'll learn a lot about how much the, the women's Super League, and specifically the clubs in it, care about it um i don't know if the fa has a fund or anything they could do i, I have no idea I, I think it i think some of the finger pointing's been at the fa but i look at the clubs if if the top clubs in the women's super league and the the, the clubs as a whole that are there if they wanted to create a fund to pay for the testing so the women's super league could continue they could they they have that ability to and if they don't want to then that's on them but they have that ability to. If Brighton couldn't do it, but Manchester City could, okay, that's the choice that is being made. I don't even know if it's come up as a possibility of creating a solidarity fund. That's why I was so impressed with Germany and those clubs doing that very early on in this process. Liverpool, uh, point uh, point from safety, eight fixtures to go. But when the season was cut, five of those fixtures would have been at home. So that's matter. where it, that's mean, what I'm saying. That's what the Liverpool situation was when the season was called on the women's side. Yeah, that's yeah. It d- doesn't matter. Like Liverpool, trust me, it has zero to do with this decision. Liverpool's not deciding not to fund women's soccer because they're worried about getting relegated. That's not the conversation here. It's just not happening. Uh, they're doing it because it's costly to do it right now, and they're choosing not to Why spend that money. So easy. All you need is a phone and a finger. Interesting. Just scroll through amazing uh, hand-picked low mileage. What are you doing, John? You understand we can hear that, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Computers misbehaving. You could press stop on it anytime or mute. I'm trying any, to. any of these things. Well, when the computer just decides not to stop, then uh, <sighs> that's the problem. Okay. Anyway, uh, Turner Kirby says, "Do you think COVID <laughs> testing will eventually become just a random selection test in leagues?" No. No, you can't do it that way. Um, if it comes to that point, then there's no point in doing it. It's something you're going to have to do uh, across the board. Right now, I mean, uh, until that changes in the population, you're going to have to do it. But I, I just, I feel like in all this stuff, like so many different things get thrown into a pot and it's not separated out. I want to, I want to try to make this clear the protocols that leagues and teams are doing, and we're talking the Bundesliga, we're talking about what La Liga has on paper, we're talking about what the Premier League has on paper, we're talking about what's been rumored to be the case in MLS, we're talking about what the NWSL is doing, we're talking about what Serie A has talked about, we're talking about all of what these leagues are doing from a protocol perspective. The basics, you're testing before you come back to group training. You're doing some individual training first to establish baseline protocols of activity. You're testing before you have group activity. Anybody who tests positive is not taking part in the group activity. Small group activity. You start ramping up. You continue doing the testing. You're testing twice a week to try to mitigate the possibility of any false test. You're testing before games. You are potentially, and Germany did it, others did it, to where you are having some kind of a training camp uh, concentration group as it's called in some countries uh, you know going away for a week whatever before you play to try to mitigate any issues with people out mingling in the community and like our goalkeeper at Bournemouth who tested positive you're, you're trying to do anything possible to get that first game played and then you are moving forward with tests twice a week all these things these are basic things I think what we have seen in all of the leagues that have made any steps in this, we don't know testing in MLS yet because they haven't moved to group t- group training yet. 
Now they have opened up the possibility for group training, but it's still isolated. That's a, a, a very small but important step, but it is still isolated. You don't have contact. It's where you go to contact training. You've got to do the testing. We don't know what the MLS testing numbers are yet because they haven't done it across the board. They will before they go to any kind of a contact training. That's period. Um, those are basics. Some are doing different things. Some are doing antibody tests along with it. Most are. That doesn't necessarily you know, protect us in terms of a safety situation, in terms of players testing you know, with antibodies. Is that going to allow you to break the spread of the virus if it comes into your team? No, that's not the issue. It can be helpful, but it's different. There's basics of protocols of safety issues that we have seen developed and we have seen implemented and have shown success. Players can be safe in these situations. There's enough of a track record to show us that. They can be safe. They do have personal responsibility. They do have things that they have to do on their own. Clubs have responsibility. Leagues have responsibility. They all have to work together to get it done, but it can be done. So we can play team sports safely. Spectators is a completely different conversation. That is a completely different conversation because you don't have that control over spectators. You don't have the control over them testing twice a week. You don't have the control over them testing 24 hours before coming to the stadium. You don't have the control over what they do once they're in the stadium. You don't have that control. That's a completely separate issue. You can play team sports in a controlled environment behind closed doors with all the testing protocols, with all the other safety protocols, and do it safely. That can happen. We have enough of a track record. Separate that. You have to do all that, but separate that. The conversation about spectators in the stands is a completely different one and is a very difficult one because you don't have that control. You can create a controlled or at least semi-controlled or controlled with personal responsibility scenario for professional sports teams to play. You could do the same for college teams, for amateur teams to play. There's a cost to doing it, and it is a big one. But you can do it. That conversation, completely separate from bringing spectators into the building. They're two different things. You can't keep throwing them all together, and you can't keep... I'm, I'm, I'm past this idea that all the reasons why you can't come back and play. You can. We've seen it. It has to be done right, but you can. Can you safely have spectators in the stands right now? I don't think you can. I don't think it's worth the risk because all of this is risk management. I hope you can very soon because clubs cannot sustain themselves long term without huge revenues coming in from other areas without fans in the stands. But is there value to playing behind closed doors right now? Yes. Is there a way to do it safely? Yes. Now it is figuring out everything else as you go. I think at times all of it gets lumped in. Some people say you can't play right now, period. I disagree. Some people say you have to have fans in the stands right now because it's okay and they're going to assume the risk. I disagree. I don't think it's there yet. It's my opinion. doesn't mean I'm right. I think on the, on the soccer side, on the field, we've seen enough to feel like it can be done. I think it can. The rest of it, I don't know. But we've got to separate these issues out when we start talking about this. And you can't separate the financial issues out. That is why teams are coming back to play, especially when you're talking about big TV contracts. Another reason why people are talking about coming back, especially with UEFA, and this is huge, uh, you're, you're basically a solidarity fund when you're UEFA. Miguel Delaney at the Independent talked about the FA Cup, talked about all the leagues coming back. UEFA's meeting June 17th to, to finalize what Champions League and Europa League look, look like. There's all kinds of different things. They might move it to one place. They, they might change the competition format. They might keep it in Istanbul. They might be able to have some spectators. Nobody knows yet. they got to figure this out in a few weeks. But you want to know why they're talking about it? 
It is seen as essential that European club competitions are completed due to contractual terms, but primarily because the broadcasting money is essential to UEFA's solidarity funds. They are more important to more national federations than ever, especially in the absence of fans. Some would not be able to survive without them. The UEFA Champions League funds football in the Faroe Islands. It funds football in Kosovo. It funds football in, in some of these different areas because of those solidarity funds that go out. It's it's just like the NCAA tournament and basketball ends up funding smaller programs because it brings a huge chunk of money in that's spread out across the membership. You don't finish these games, you're going to have some federations that don't have the revenue to operate. And it's going to be down to volunteers to keep it alive. Who knows what it looks like? I mean, it's just, it's a mess. Um, I don't know. But they're going to have to find a way to finish it. And there's talk that games could be moved to, to Lisbon or to cities in Germany. It is down to money, as everything is. And it's not just UEFA. It's not just the clubs that are involved that are at risk of losing money here. Pretty much everybody in the game in Europe is at risk of losing money here. That's and and I think that the way that you put it, giving it the comparison of the NCAA tournament for Division One basketball, I think that's uh, the best analogy that I've heard when it comes to explaining the importance of UEFA when it comes to the game. So, uh, yeah, I mean. They are, they're, the, they're that solidarity fund for all of those nations that still want to have something going on, still love the game, still have that vision of making that run into that competition that they would be a part of in some manner, way, shape, or form. But, no, I think that the, the, the NCAA tournament comparison is, is a solid one. That's the best one that I've heard. I mean, you just got to get it done. Uh, the FA Cup is that in England. I mean, that money is going to go into the FA. That is going to help some of these smaller programs and – and organizations that need it. Uh, Money's driving a lot of this. Money's driving the conversation about Major League Baseball coming back. It's driving the conversation about the National Hockey League, even though they say it's not. Don't lie to us, Gary Bettman. Come on. It's driving the conversation with the NBA. It's driving the conversation with MLS and the NWSL in a different way because they're going to lose money either way, and they're going to lose a lot of money either way because you're not going to have fans in the stands straight away. But they're trying to find a way to secure the long-term future. They're able to basically invest right now in, in keeping it going. It's driving every conversation, whether it is a sports team, whether it is a restaurant, whether it is a venue that is not able to have live events right now, whether it is a shop. It is driving every business conversation. How can you make enough money to keep the doors open right now? There's no hiding from that. Does just because it's sports doesn't mean that that's not okay. Um, the Major League Baseball situation, I mean, it's it's complicated, and there's a lot more to it than just this basic level. Uh, Turner Kirby shared a, a tweet from For the Win, and I mean, my take without studying Major League Baseball in depth on a regular basis, uh, but you know, going through when I was in high school, the strike and lockout and was it a lockout was it a strike or was it both in 94 95 both it, it ended up being both if i yeah. yeah um you lost a world series because of it then that's honestly where i started to fall out of love of baseball you and me both i didn't follow it the same way after that uh right now they're at even more risk and they've got to see the bigger picture i mean just like we talked about with big clubs in england you've got teams across major league baseball uh, cutting minor leaguers right now who are making four hundred bucks a month or four hundred bucks a week, I think, or is it four hundred bucks a month? What was it? Four hundred, four hundred a week. Four hundred a week. Um, you're cutting them. You're you're cutting salaries uh, from those teams. They're probably not going to play games this year. I don't think there's any way minor league baseball could make it work financially. But you're cutting these people, and you know this is your next potential source of talent. Minor league baseball could not exist no matter what MLB and the MLB players do right now minor league baseball could cease to exist on the whole not just the 40 teams they were talking about before on the whole I mean like figure it out tell me how it's going to work financially right now it's not 
major league baseball teams and and the players cannot find any kind of understanding of how to move forward and they're strangling the game 100 percent. it's the yep. worst of any leagues any game any sport that has been dealing with this they are handling it the absolute worst it's awful i mean I, the the biggest thing you have to have to understand in this is this is basically a precursor to the next cba mm-hmm. because the the cba for mlb expires at the end of 2021 so you can't separate it completely and there's potential that that next cba could have been contentious like this without COVID-19, but now it's public and where other leagues are finding ways forward, Major League Baseball looks completely awful and nobody's coming out of it looking good. You know, the the owners have made more money in recent years than ever before. They are facing catastrophic losses right now. There, there's no denying that. Players are coming off as greedy, but players are also fighting against different issues that they've had with owners for decades and decades and decades. Nobody looks good in this. Nobody. And the game is suffering dramatically, and it's at a time where it couldn't. Because soccer is growing in this country, because other sports are growing, because the average baseball fan, the average age of the hardcore baseball fan I think last time, last study I saw, you're talking in the mid sixties, mid fifties at the youngest. I, I yeah. want to say mid sixties. Um, you're not connecting with the younger generation like you used to, and soccer is, and other sports are, and baseball's not, and this is not the time that you can afford to have what's going on. So they have passed Scotland and the Premier League and others in the way that they look dealing with it, and they're doing huge damage to their sport. Luckily, we haven't had that. Luckily, even in MLS, where they still have things to sort out, and there's still questions, and Casper Shabilko went public uh, yesterday with the Philadelphia Inquirer about you know being upset about families not being able to be part of the Orlando plan idea. Even with things like that, that's nowhere near what Major League Baseball is at right now. I mean, the, the things that are coming out of players, former players, front offices – unnamed sources all of it it's it's just maddening if you care about baseball and luckily we haven't got there in ls and i hope we don't i hope we get something sorted out here soon it feels like they're both coming from a place of trying to cooperate which is good which is needed especially right now and i hope that soccer does not look at what major league baseball is doing to itself and saying that's the way to go let's do that let's light ourselves on fire yeah, from both ends. Yeah, I uh, know it's all of it. It's 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 not uh, it's not an either side is doing okay here at all. It's no. it's both sides look very bad, and both sides are are making this worse. They have to find a way forward. More importantly, they have to shut up, and they have to actually get on a Zoom call or Google Meet or Skype call or whatever you want to use because there's so many different ways and actually talk and sort this out and get over yourselves because you're killing the game what you said it's annoying um it's one of those days uh we're gonna get mike conti on the line here in just a second john why don't we do that why don't you tell us about apolinsky and associates I could do that. AA-legal.com, Stephen Apolinsky and Associates, Apolinsky and Associates, LLC. Wrongful death, serious injury attorneys, proud sponsors of everything soccer down here in the SDH networks. A couple different ways if you want to reach out to them in their 30 years of experience where they have grown over $40 million in judgments for their clients in Alabama and Georgia. AA-legal.com on the web. Pop-up window, low right-hand corner, live chat, 24-7, 365, if you want to hang out that way. What you can also do, give them a call, 404-377-9191, get a free consultation, or you can shoot Steve an email at steve at aa-legal.com, S-T-E-V-E, at aa-legal.com. Recognized as legal elite by Georgia Trend Magazine, top 100 lawyers in the state of Georgia. And I'm going to keep talking until Mike finishes his sentence, so that way we can bring him in from the keyboard how was that promo mike at aa-legal oh, it was outstanding it was outstanding as always john <laughs> i think that so might what- be his best work yeah, yeah no I, I i agree i mean they are really getting consistently better 
And that's that's really saying something because you're very good at that to begin with. Well, I, I thought that, you know, when Jason said that it might be my best work, it's like that whole two minutes of the entire two hours is my best work every day. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you got to hang your hat on something, right? You know. Uh, you know. Most importantly, Mike, what's in the egg this weekend? Uh, you know, n- nothing really fancy today. Uh, it, we're getting to the point now where I'm starting to run out of ideas, and also it's getting very, very hot. Uh-huh. So, you know, I don't want to be putting a big tomahawk ribeye on there and slathering it in butter and trying to eat that on a 90-degree evening. So um going to do uh, kind of like a stuffed chicken thing tonight, uh, a little chicken caprese deal where um, – you, you basically, you take a chicken breast, you split it, you stuff it with tomato basil and fresh mozzarella. Oh. You've been marinating that chicken in some balsamic vinegar. Uh, and just a couple minutes per side, and onto the bun it goes. So nothing really exciting. I'm counting on Leanne to, to spice things up a bit with a good side. Uh, and I think she's going to do an orzo salad. So uh, oh. we'll see how it turns out. But, but like, I just I don't want to eat heavy meals now. I, we're in, you know, the light let's eat a cucumber season uh oh and, there'll be uh, none of that <laughs> <laughs> well <laughs> i think yeah, john's no, afraid I, of believe cucumbers. me i don't like it i don't like it but um you know we kind of gorged on burgers and chicken sausage and pulled pork and all the memorial day stuff last weekend so trying to throttle it back a little bit what's going on your grill uh a new propane tank because we still have to go get one once you get that propane tank, what's going on your grill? <laughs> oh, we, we we have various and sundry meats and the finest meats and cheeses. And uh, he usually has no we'll idea. Fly, He's stalling. Well, we, well, we have a lot of different things, and <laughs> I am not the one that dictates what dinner no, is. I, I understand that. I understand. I Usually, I am not the decision maker either on what goes on the grill. It's just Ding. we've tied it. We've tied it into a thing we're doing for the radio station, so it gives me license to make the calls, just so I can look a little more bougie than I usually am. All right, we got a little bit of this. Uh, Tom Marshall reported this. Tom Marshall for ESPN covers the Mexican national team, Mexican league. Uh, Reports coming out. Uh, This is from uh, Televisa News in Mexico City. Yes. Uh, Cruz Azul president Billy Alvarez and others high up in the the cement company that owns it have had their bank accounts frozen. They are being investigated for money laundering and possible links to organized crime. And good morning. Welcome to Cruz Azul. I was hoping for a more positive breaking news uh, update such as MLS announces its return to play. Uh, that's <laughs> kind of like opposite on the scale of positivity. Yeah, that's, don't uh, have that just yet. Sorry. No. Yeah, that, and that's interesting because you're you're in the midst of an off season down there in Mexico right now, and I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I don't even know what the the transfer rules are down there, and if teams can go out and sign players or, right now, or what's going on, but. Uh, uh, that certainly will make navigating this offseason even harder for Cruz and Zola, I would assume. There's actually been some talk about the transfer window, and, and this was coming out of Argentina, and, and it's not defined yet by FIFA. FIFA's got a few things on their docket that they've got to sort out here coming up very soon. World Cup qualifying, what the international calendar can look like, but also international transfer windows because they're all going to be different now uh there's some talk that they could be seeing and this is from the argentine perspective but i think it does overlap some with with different parts of the world there's talk that they could be seeing the transfer window for the summer pushed back to ending at the end of september which Mm -hmm. does kind of line up with what we're seeing from the potential of the Spanish league, their next season starting in September. That's what uh, Tebas, Javier Tebas said to said yesterday in the local Spanish media. That's what we've heard a little bit from, from England and some whispers that if everything pushes back, I do think that would affect MLS because I don't think it would benefit them to have their transfer window end August one when, some seasons around the world are not done by August one. I think they'd probably push theirs back too. I think Mexico would be the same. 
So keep an eye on that. It, it hasn't been defined by FIFA yet because they've got a lot of things on their plate, but those transfer windows could get pushed back into September, which I think from what we're hearing about an MLS calendar, what we're hearing about others, does kind of make sense. Yeah, well, and it, honestly, I mean, it would correspond to when the transfer window would usually hit the MLS schedule in the summer. Right. Uh, you know, if we're talking about September, you know, optimistically, what, we've played two games and we'll have five in Orlando reportedly and maybe another five or six in August. Uh, you know, so that would take you to, what, 12 to 14 matches. That's about where you are in mid-July, maybe a little bit behind that, but close enough. Uh, and also 12 to 14 matches would certainly be enough time to, uh, you know, kind of evaluate the sample size that you've been given with on-field play, and then you can go make a, a you know, roster move that you feel is necessary. So, yeah, I, I mean, that that would seem... That would seem to be the most common sense solution, but we're talking about FIFA where common sense does not always uh, <laughs> row the boat, so uh, maybe not, but it's, it would it would definitely right make a lot of sense. It, it uh, is. It, that their calendar defense, is going mean, to be really tough. Yeah, and I mean, and you might be looking at some really unconventional solutions to this where maybe you uh, expand the size of these transfer windows uh, or add a third transfer window or something like there, I'm sure all options are on the table right now. Uh, and this is one of about a bazillion things that FIFA still needs to figure out. Like, are we going to have a club world cup this year? Uh, no, you know, way. I don't see how, no what way. do you do with, uh, you know, world cup qualifying that, that may have started at the tail end of this year. And does everything get pushed back and compressed? I know that's more of a confederation decision, but no, FIFA FIFA is related to that too. And right. And like, cause you do the way, the way the world cup qualifying goes. And this was something that I, I don't know if, if everybody follows it that closely, like the, the confederation world cup qualifying formats, it's all part of a FIFA draw. Now, FIFA works with the confederations to figure out what that format looks like, but the way groups are drawn and things is something that FIFA does. And right. now we've already heard from CONCACAF that they're going to have to change their format because they're not going to be able to do it. And actually, we have a little bit of news on that. This is uh, reporting out of Panama. Get uh, it. Wait, wait. Let's get a sounder. Oh, we need a sounder. Okay, well, it's it's not breaking news. So oh, let never me, mind. Let me hear uh, this one. But yeah, there's a different one for development. Good That's enough. The, uh, the siren up in Dawsonville, right? Yes. <laughs> for Chase Elliott last. That yes. is the Concacaf siren, and and Concacaf, okay. uh, according to RPC TV in Panama. It's very likely that the format for Concacaf's World Cup qualifiers will be three groups of four. And it'll be based on the FIFA ranking. Uh, it was going to be one group of six in the hex, and that was going to be based on FIFA ranking. Now it's going to be 12, three groups of four. You win your group, you go. You go to the World Cup. Uh, less margin for error, flat out. And remember how CONCACAF had this crazy like secondary tournament for all the teams yeah. outside of the hex that were going to play down and have a champion. Then they were going to play the fourth place team from the hex. Well, now the best second place team from those three groups of four will play the winner of that tournament of everybody else to see then who plays in the intercontinental playoff. I mean, that's going to be a really, really nervy, tense You're, it's crazy uh, you're going from I, I mean, 10 games to decide if you go to six right home and home i mean mm -hmm. imagine if usa is, is, and i'm going to assume seating will go according to fifa world rankings or or something close to that yes uh you know imagine if usa is put in a group with, i don't think it would be unreasonable to i'm, I'm just going to throw out an example group usa honduras Canada and uh, I don't know uh, um, uh, Martinique uh, or St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Yeah, I don't Vincent, know how yeah. the groups will get filled out exactly. I don't know if they'll just do a straight seed, but we can we can figure out from the FIFA rankings right now as to how they could look. So your top three seeds are Mexico, U.S., and Costa Rica, right? They're going to be each in separate groups. Then you're going to play one of Jamaica, 
Honduras, or El Salvador. Right. Then one of Panama, Canada, Trinidad, and to well, Curacao, I think. I think Curacao is actually a full FIFA member. So, yes, yeah, so that would be them. So, Panama, Canada, or Curacao. Mm. And then the last one would be Trinidad and Tobago, Haiti, and Antigua and Barbuda. Okay, so again, like if you're USA and you get put in with Honduras, Canada, and uh, Haiti, you, you're going to have to get road results to go uh-huh. to the World Cup. Uh-huh. Yeah. You know, not only are you going to have to get wins at home, you will need to get road results. Do you feel confident that the USA could go into San Pedro mm-hmm. Sula and get a result? Do you, I, I don't feel confident they could go up to Toronto and get a result. We saw mm-hmm. as recently as October that they cannot. Man, that is a nervy, nervy situation. Um, but it will be very exciting. It'll be very intense. Yeah. It'll be a lot of fun. Um, honestly, it, it's like so far down the road that I can't even think about it right now. But... Good Lord. I mean, you, you could, depending on how that gets filled out, you now, again, you could get into a, a pretty reasonable group with, um, you know, say, Jamaica, Curacao, and Antigua and Barbuda. But um, even that would have challenges. Mm-hmm. A- again, because you have to get road results, uh, which is not a guarantee in, in CONCACAF, especially with, uh, I mean, we know the quality of of stadiums and and pitches on which they play these qualifiers. So, mm, it, that that will be very very spicy when we get to that point. You ain't yeah. kidding, brother. Yeah, this is this is rough. Um we'll see. Uh we'll see if we get anything out of MLS uh, in the next couple of days as well. I I was kind of thinking we would hear something by the end of the I, week, well, but don't, maybe Don't you not? think you kind of did yesterday with the small bit. group thing? I, I I know that's a small step, but I think that's a really significant Still, step. Still, a step, yeah. yeah One thing and, about and I, that that I, I want to make clear, and because I think there's been some question about where, where testing comes into play. The way they're doing small groups, it's not contact small groups. Exactly. They're still separate. They can interact. Like, before, they couldn't interact. Now you can interact, but you still have to keep the distance. So yeah. there's no need to do the testing to go to this step. Yeah, it, instead of you know one person every half field, now it's six people on a full field. Yeah. And basically, this graduates to the point where you can take shots on a goalkeeper. Yeah, they can um, work together more in or less. groups, but they just can't yeah. interact completely. No contact but, yet. But, but I think it is a step. It, yeah. it, it's a small step, but it's a step. You have DC coming back to training today. You're down to two now, San Chicago. Jose and Chicago. Uh, Chicago's back, too? Chicago, we got news. Um, let me make sure I got it right. But, I think they are back to training either today or this weekend. Um, uh, may voluntarily return to club facilities for individual workouts today. There you go. So, I mean, it, you are you are at the point now where you could, I mean, they did not lift the training moratorium yesterday. I think that's important to point out too. And there's been some confusion on that. That's the for training the interaction. War- yeah. Right. That's still in place, but mm-hmm. I think now, I mean, you have to make a call on that on Monday because that's when it expires. Mm-hmm. I would guess the league is now going to be in a position where they can be a little bit more aggressive uh, in moving forward with training in home markets uh, where gradually they could ramp this up to small group contact training maybe within a week or two. And then then you're within the Disney World timeline where uh, you could be doing full team training on, on June 21st. So I, I think everything is still kind of on track for that, on track for what had been reported I can't remember Tuesday night, maybe about, uh, yeah. con- or maybe it was Wednesday, condensing the Orlando tournament, sending everyone down there on the twenty first, week and a half of training, and then you go to matches. You're still on track for that. Uh, you know, Jeff Lorenowitz was made available to the the media yesterday. I know you you guys are probably aware of what he said. It, it sounds like there are still questions that uh, the league is working through and trying to answer. Jeff did say he expected some decisions pretty soon. Yeah. Uh, I didn't get the impression from Jeff yesterday that that there's any kind of stalemate or or um you know impasse with the financial issues tied to it 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 sounds like they're 
they're in a good spot there. It's more of the health and safety protocols. Now, interestingly, Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida, uh, was on a radio show up in Nashville today and said that uh, if it were up to him, he would not quarantine NBA and MLS players at Disney World because they aren't quarantining grocery store workers. Um, Ron DeSantis is not making the call, obviously. Mm -hmm. It's the League and the Players Union, but that's just one more little wrinkle to add into all of this. I think where we're at, guys, is, I mean, they're definitely going to go to Orlando. They're definitely going to do something down there. The only question is how long and when is it going to be announced. Now, I really do think we are within days of an announcement. I, I really do get that mm -hmm. impression. Uh, and, and some specifics may not be announced. Um, you know, kind of similar to the NHL. They announced their plan for restarting play, but they did not affix a certain date to it. I think once you get an agreement in principle from the players and the league on how to proceed with this Orlando thing, you'll get an announcement in short order. But what you may not get is, okay, uh, here are the four groups. Uh, here, here's the fixture schedule. Uh, I, I don't think it, that's going to take time to work out. One thing right. Jeff Lorenowitz pointed out yesterday, I agree with, it, you know, he said, look, we don't want this to look like the Dallas Cup. Yeah. We're going to be on TV. Uh, we're representing the league. It is important that the product is good. And he's really concerned. And he, I think I, I got the impression from what he said that he feels the league does not really fully understand or appreciate how difficult it is to ask a team to play at 10.30 p.m. Uh, and then turn around and play at 8 p.m. four days later. Um, that That is tough. That is something that teams are going to have to adjust to. If there are morning fixtures as well, which have been reported, that that's going to be tricky. Jeff said it's not like we're going to be training in the hallways like we have to do at Dallas Cup, but there are some elements that are going to be very, very uncomfortable and hard for players to adjust to, and he does not want to see – the quality of play be at such a point that it would demean the league, and I agree with that. I think the other key thing he said, which I do agree think, with, is one, that... One question, Mike, real quick. Do yeah. you think that part of what Jeff was, was talking about, and this was one thing I read into it, maybe I'm completely off base, as much as the quality of play, the presentation, was something the players yes. were concerned with? Absolutely, yeah. And this is something, I did Alexi Lalas tweet this yesterday? It's not going to be a good look playing on essentially practice fields with maybe an empty set of 200 seats. Uh, I I agree. I have said all along I wish they would do this just in home markets and empty stadiums. It, it would look better. It's working in the Bundesliga. But we're too, I, again, believe we are too far down the road towards Orlando. So this is the way it's going to be. I also don't but, know if you could do that in every market. I, I And the travel and everything going along with it, like well, right now, it, you're I don't right. think you can do that right now. You're right, but you could go to four or six hubs. I, you could. I, I do believe that. I mean, you, I do believe you could put a group in Orlando and a group in Dallas and a group in Houston and a group maybe, uh, I don't know, an L.A. group and somewhere in the Northeast. Hell, Pennsylvania now has suddenly opened for pro sports. So, I mean, maybe you have a group in Philadelphia or something like that. I don't know. I, I think Here's a question I have about presentation. And, and I don't think it's been answered. And Turner Kirby's asking it in Twitch as well about, will there be some games played at Exploria Stadium during the plan or is everything at the Wild World of Sports? You've got Exploria. You've got, uh, what is the Citrus Bowl called now? Camping World Stadium. That's it. That's it. You've got those two. You don't have another venue... You've got the stadium venue at Wild World of Sports, which looks good on TV. We've seen games yes. from there before. That can work. You've got those three. Is there anywhere else there? UCF. That... Yeah, UCF, right. has yeah, a, yeah, right. UCF. UCF has a football stadium. Is it wide enough? I don't know if it's wide enough, but I know they have a soccer stadium that's wide enough. Uh, yeah, that's, what else? that's actually true. I, I think maybe if you look at that, it could affect some of the presentation questions, and, and it would look better. But Even then, how what's Lang, the... if you want to go over to St. Pete and, and play... You, some i don't know well heck yeah you could go to al lang you could go to raymond james stadium mm -hmm. i mean that but now you're getting into a, 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 you know wait a minute a, the whole point of this was to quarantine everyone because it would be safer and now i mean 
you guys know, I mean, to get to the, the Citrus Bowl from Disney World on a good day with no traffic is a 45-minute bus ride. Mm-hmm. So now, wait a minute. I mean, what is it, not to mention if you if you take teams out of the bubble to Exploria or the Citrus Bowl or to UCF, how do you maintain sufficient safety protocols around those facilities? I mean, the Citrus Bowl and Exploria are in downtown Orlando. But what um, that brings us to is, I think, what we're seeing in Germany and, and the questions that you've had all along about the quarantine issue. And it seems like there's a lot of pushback on that. Germany's not doing that, and they're traveling right. you know, around the country. Yeah. Um, can you create an environment like what we're seeing with the NWSL? And they're not quarantining either, the NWSL. The players are able to interact. They are able to do things, but they do have protocols that they're being asked to follow as well, which is going to be part of it. Can you find that middle ground now that things are different from where they were when we started talking about Orlando and there was a thought you had to quarantine to play? I think we know that's not the case now. It's 100% not the case. And again, Bundesliga has gone two weeks, no major problems. NASCAR has gone more than two weeks, no major problems that we're aware of, right? The protocols are allowing that. That's a key. Right. The right. testing well, yeah, yeah. is allowing I mean, that. That's a key. We're, we're not saying, uh, yeah, I mean, we're not saying rip the Band-Aid off and, you know, <laughs> go out to Olive Garden and then go play a soccer match. Like, we're not saying that. We're, we're just saying that with the protocols in place, you, I think you can accomplish the same thing you're attempting to accomplish in Orlando in either a home market or a hub market. Uh, and, and I would just, I would really rethink, it's too late, I think, that, that they've probably, again, the train is out of the station and way down the tracks on this, but, I mean, if the whole goal was to get ESPN some TV inventory, you can still accomplish that by calling this a quote-unquote restart tournament, playing five group stage matches that, that do count in the standings, but you don't have to play them at Disney World. Uh, and and maybe a hub is a compromise. And if you're worried about competitive balance and say it would not be fair for Orlando to play in its own hub because they can sleep in their own beds at night, then send Orlando to Houston uh, if, if that's a concern. The, the NHL has talked about that, right? Uh, what's that? NHL has talked about that, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah, and that's one of the problems. that That's why they haven't decided their hub cities yet. Okay. Uh, you know, if you put Pittsburgh – as a hub city and the penguins are playing in that hub uh-huh. the flyers and the lightning and the bruins are saying well now wait a minute you can't do that yeah you know even if they're sequestered in a hotel they're still using their own dressing room they're playing in their own building so i don't know i, I again you know it when, when i first heard this proposal i was disappointed because i thought you could do better uh you know it sounds like they are addressing one of my major concerns which is the the you know, length of time uh, of which everyone must be in the bubble. I think there is still time to refine this and avoid a lot of the issues that the players are very concerned about. And yeah, I, again, I do question, I know there are protocols in place and safety first, but I do question the rationale of putting the entire league in the same hotel. I think you have to have firewalls. And, and one of the firewalls could potentially be do what the Bundesliga has done, where, you know, you're keeping teams in their home markets under protocol, under very close supervision with constant testing. Uh, and, and that way, if, God forbid, you did have an outbreak with one team, you don't have to fear that the rest of the league has been exposed. Um, but again, what do I know? Uh, anyhow, that, that, that's that's one big component of what Jeff Lorenzo was talking about. And the, the other thing he said, too, I, I really agree with this. You know, these players keep getting asked, well, if the Bundesliga can do it, why can't MLS? Jeff Lorenzo has made a really good point. The, the situation in the Bundesliga is a lot more straightforward and a lot less complicated than what MLS is dealing with because the Bundesliga does not have to deal with transport or travel. And Germany, geographically, is much, much smaller than the United States, not to mention Germany has kind of federalized the the health protocols that the Bundesliga is working with, and you don't have certain states in Bavaria that aren't allowing their teams to use their facilities right now. 
that is still, at least now in one case with San Jose, we're down to one, still a problem in MLS. So um, these things don't get hammered out overnight. They do take time. It sounds like they're getting closer. But I, I just hope before a final decision is made, maybe everyone steps back and takes a breath and just looks at this one more time and someone asks the question, is this the only way to proceed? Or are there other ways we can proceed and still get matches started in a relatively short period of time? Jeff said he didn't think it would take long once you go to full team. Yeah, uh, Maybe two weeks. He said you know, the tactical stuff might get messy at first, but you'll figure that out in your first couple games. Uh, you know, you're, If your goal is to play on July 4th, you can do it, and you don't need to go to Disney World. I really do believe that. Time is running out, but I think there is still time for them to take a step back and really evaluate, is this the only way to do it? And again, if, if your concern is to make your broadcast partners whole, you, come on, you can do that playing anywhere. You can do that playing anywhere and make your broadcast partners whole. Uh, yes, there is Disney infrastructure at the wide world of sports, which you know I guess some of those practice fields are wired up for cameras, but... I mean, you send a crew into a stadium the day before, they wire up four or five cameras, and you go play. Um, it's not that hard. Also, Mike, you, you mentioned uh, firewalls. I don't think Casper Shabilko is going to be the only person to say what he said by the time we get closer to teams coming back out on, onto the pitch in MLS. Uh, interview with Jonathan Tannenwald yesterday. Shabilko is concerned about players with young children. Uh, Montero and Glesnes have new arrivals. Badoya and his wife have a two-year-old and a five-year-old at their home. Uh, Shabilko says we should think about families and recent parents like my teammates. They should be allowed to come with us because it's a huge burden on players leaving their families at home. Yes, robustly agree. Or give the players the option to opt out. Um, and again, like the the NHL is working on a plan where families would be allowed into the bubble after a certain point. Uh, once you get enough teams knocked out, um, you know there seems to be a little bit of back and forth on the NBA side now about letting families into the bubble. Uh, again, you don't have that concern if you don't have a bubble in the first place. I, I just, I really strongly believe, and I'm not an infectious disease expert, but I, I, I just really strongly believe now that we are beyond the point of requiring a bubble to do this. Because, again, other organizations that have implemented protocols have been able to successfully get started outside of bubbles. Uh, and, and Italy's not doing a bubble, right? Spain isn't doing a bubble, as far as we know. Uh, England isn't doing a bubble. So if we continue to take cues from what they have done in Europe uh, in the response to this virus, why can't we take these cues now? So uh, the only thing I would say is uh, we've seen this plan evolve a little bit as we've gone. Um, I think the bubble idea was heavily talked about at the very beginning. Um, I hope that like what you're saying, think we're learning that that's not necessarily a must at this point. If you I, have strong, if you have strong protocols, it is not necessarily. Yeah. A must. Yeah. You have to have the strong protocols. And I think we know what those are at this point. I mean, I think we yeah. know from the different organizations, different leagues that have been back that have started training. I mean, there's some basics. It's, it's all of the ramping up and, and MLS honestly created a, a new step with the, the group training that is still separate. Like they're doing right now. That's something that nobody else has done. That's a bridge, but it's it's the individual training, establishing the training protocols. It's then testing. It's then isolating anybody who tests positive and dealing with that separate from the group. It's doing the group training with contact, graduating to full team training, testing the whole way, doing testing before you get into any kind of game scenario. Even if it's, if it's more ramped up that week, okay, fine. And then it's testing all the way through. And, and as we're seeing reports from studies coming out in Europe, as they've studied the Bundesliga games, as they've studied other games, there is extremely low risk of players being around one another for the amount of time that it takes for this to be a risky transmission situation if players yep. are positive. But you're doing all the testing to ensure that they're not positive. 
you've got a lot of like firewalls a word you've used you got a lot of firewalls in these protocols that leagues are using you're good I, I think you can find a new way where and maybe they're talking about this i would hope so uh, they need to listen to what Casper Shabilko is saying. Not every player is in the same situation. And you've made some adjustments to the plan. Keep listening. Keep making adjustments. If this is the way to get back on the field as fast as possible, and look, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna hide from it as cheaply as possible. Like you're gonna lose a ton of money this year regardless of what you do. If this is a cost effective way to do it and to do it as fast as possible and safe. Do it, but listen to your players, and if they need to opt out, let them opt out. If yeah, I, they, I agree. If you need to make concessions, make concessions, but you got to move forward. I, it's the clock's ticking. Uh, yeah, and you're you're losing time. Yeah, I don't want to say you're wasting time because no, I think they're working on it, but they are losing time. You want to get back as quickly and safely as possible. I think that's a common goal of owners, league players, broadcasters, everyone. Everyone wants this back as quickly and as safely as possible. You're in the window now where you can do it safely, I think. Uh, And by the way, I don't think the announcement from the governor of Texas yesterday should be ignored or considered to be insignificant. The door is open, at least in one state now, and I think others will probably follow that lead as long as, you know, there's no major uh, negative development with the the virus. Uh, The door is going to be open for fans sooner rather than later. And again, that's where I think you you have to be a little bit careful with your timeline where, you know, if things get pushed back a little bit further with this Orlando thing, and now you're playing into mid August down in Orlando, you're going to lose part of your window where you could have maybe partial capacity in some places. I'm not saying everywhere. Uh, And it it goes back to what I've been saying all along. If the NFL and college football are going to have at least partial capacity this year, MLS could be in position to do that as well uh, and maybe make the financial situation not as bleak as it could have been uh, if you played an entire season behind closed doors. One of the reports I saw, I, I know... Jason, you and I on Wednesday on stoppage time, we put up some theoretical calendars, and and I I, I guess hypothesized that you could have any from twenty to twenty two matches in market once you break Orlando. I saw another report that the plan is eighteen matches in market. Uh, most teams have already played one, so you're you're basically. You're looking at getting 10 home matches this year as opposed to 17. And if you can have fans in a few of them, again, I mean, it's not pretty. You're going to, it's it's not going to be a pretty financial picture, but it's better than making nothing. Uh, and, MLS and that's can where think, handle this a lot easier than anybody sure. else, too, because they are a single entity. And yeah. the question that's going to come up, let's say it's the NFL, if the Cowboys are able to have fans in the stands to. 25 percent but in detroit the lions are able to have nobody in the stands and then if the the seahawks can have 10 competitive balance but also cost and money and revenue i think mls sharing revenues can can handle that a little bit better but it's going to be a challenge i mean none of this is easy everybody's figuring it out as we go and there's new issues every day and also it seems like new solutions every day that are coming up too so yeah, I agree, but I'm optimistic. I really am. Uh, and and Jeff said yesterday he thought some decisions would be made pretty soon. So hopefully that's a good sign. I, I think you know with the the condensed tournament on the table now and the the possibility that you may not need to send anyone down there for for basically three more weeks. That's enough time to get this hammered out. Maybe graduate to contact training and home markets not full team, but contact training, test everyone before you go and get on down there. Um, Because I I think when it's all said and done, we are going to end up having the Orlando thing. I I don't think it's necessary. I think a better way is out there, but I think the train is too far down the tracks. They're going to go to Orlando, but they can still get this done and get matches played with it. I mean, what's today, guys? Uh, May 29th, 29th, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, within a month, 
maybe slightly longer than that, we could have matches uh, if they can get this hammered out pretty quickly. And that's exciting. I'm, I'm really optimistic about that. Yeah, the one question I'll have is once we get a little bit further down the road with Orlando format and everything coming along with it, I hope that the the trade-off for doing it is it's going to help MLS financially. It has to. There, there's no other reasoning to do it outside of that. You know, I mean, the yeah. NWSL doing theirs, they're doing it in Utah, and there were other sites that, that, that bid for it. There were other sites that wanted to do it. Del, Del Loy Hansen's putting up a lot of money, a lot of resources to make that happen, and they're doing it in that format, and they're bringing in sponsors. Can MLS monetize this? If they can, or, or, that will help offset some of the losses they're going to have this year. Yeah, or uh, conversely, would this Orlando thing be a way to avoid having to pay rebates to sponsors, avoid having to pay rebates to sure. your TV partners? I, I, I think that's Monetize it even too. if it's not losing. Yeah, monetize it's, it in like, some format. At this point in our world, keeping money is yeah. just as good as making new money. And, and that might be what it comes down to. It's not like they're trying to create a new revenue stream by doing this, but they're trying to keep as much money on the books as they possibly can. Yeah, uh, and that's that's part of the reality for any sports organization. Um, even, you know, uh, the NFL's trying to figure that out. If they are, of course, everybody else is too. So we'll see. I hope we get an announcement this weekend. I hope we have to do a special stoppage time and, and pop in on Facebook to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope so too. I mean, I, I don't think we're going to get anything this weekend, but if we do, yeah, we'll do a special version of stoppage time. My guess would be probably Monday. Uh, yeah. And I think the league would be smart to wait, even if they get a deal in principle this weekend. I think they would be smart to wait uh, until uh, maybe a weekday where the news cycle can dedicate a little more attention to it. Um, real opportunity here for the league. I mean, the National Hockey League kind of pulled a fast one on everyone by saying, yeah, we're going to announce a return to play plan. Uh, and you get, you know, national broadcasts of Gary Bentman making this Zoom call on NBC and in Sportsnet in Canada, and they kind of pulled a fast one on everyone. They didn't really have much of a plan that hadn't already been reported. No, and then so, he lied and said they were going to be the first team sport back, and they're not. Which is not, yeah, they're not. <laughs> the I, NWSL's I still, beating them. Uh, I, I still think MLS will be back uh, playing games too. that count before the NHL. I, I strongly believe that. Uh, I, I think Major League Baseball will play games that count before the National Hockey Ooh. League. I know that sounds crazy right now, but I really do believe that. So, I hope so. You know, it, the NHL did a really, really good job of owning the news cycle on Tuesday going into Wednesday morning. I think MLS, even if they have a deal like at 5 o'clock today, wait until Monday, wait until you can get a few more eyeballs on this. Because that's the point of all of this. You're trying to expose people to MLS that have not sampled the product. So you, you have to be really, really careful and very, very smart about how you make the announcement once that, that time comes. We will see. Uh, hopefully we'll be talking between now and then. If not, we'll talk to you on Wednesday. Okay, guys. Take Have care. A good Have weekend. a good weekend. Be good. See ya. All right. Make sure you're following in Mike Conti 929 for all the updates on all of Atlanta sports. Uh, nuts on Twitter with the stuff from the Falcons, with the stuff from the Hawks, with the stuff from NASCAR as well, because you have to pay attention – I think to all of it, you know, because in this country, there's a lot of overlap in who's going to get fans in the stands, who's going to handle protocols correctly, what they're going to look like, what timing looks like, what different parts of the country look like. It's, it is a holistic conversation right now in sports. So uh, Mike Conti 929 on Twitter for all the latest updates from him. Um, AP article about the Frauen Bundesliga. I wanted to, to go back and revisit real quick. Uh, Rob Harris, James Ellingsworth posted this, and it's a little more information just about the the women's game coming back in Germany and and other issues. So Italy has not said what their women's league is going to do just yet. They have not made that call at the moment. Uh, in the article from the AP, they talk about the Solidarity Fund. They talk about the schedule. They did have to do the same thing that the men did in the Bundesliga with a seven-day quarantine before the first game of the restart. 
I think that's a governmental ask that that they've had. I don't know exactly the line of thinking there. Again, it feels like an abundance of caution, which I understand. It's a little bit harder for the Frauen Bundesliga players to be able to do that as opposed to the highly paid first division Bundesliga teams. Um, Freiburg defender Sharon Beck told a German TV uh, broadcaster, SWR, there are a lot of players who have jobs and who have to take vacation now for that, for the quarantine. It doesn't really seem to me that it's about looking after our health, and instead it's just about keeping the sponsors from bailing out. Um, you've got players who are students, and uh, Hoffenheim's coach is not going to be at the game because he's a teacher, and he can't take time off from teaching to do the quarantine to be ready for the season. That's a little weird thing. Um, I wonder if MLS will have to do that. When we talk about little weird things and, and inconsistencies in Italy, the government is still holding on to the idea that if there is a positive test, that teams must quarantine for 14 days. That is still being reported. Um, this is from... Uh, the Minister of Sports, Spatafora. He said, It was a very useful meeting, and as we had said from the start, football was always going to resume when we had the conditions to ensure safety, and the committee gave the go-ahead to the protocol. Italy is getting back on track, and it is only fair that football should too. The committee agreed with the protocol, but confirmed the absolute necessity for a quarantine period if a player tests positive. Um... They're talking about a 14-day quarantine for the team if a player tests positive. I don't know if that's changed. That's going to be very difficult to complete a schedule. That's not what the Bundesliga has. That's not what La Liga has. That's not what the Premier League has. The difference in Germany is that local health departments can enforce a quarantine, as they did in the Dynamo Dresden situation. They, the league is not doing that. So keep an eye on that one, because Italian clubs have said, you know, how can we do this? How can we have a schedule this way? Like, this doesn't make any sense because there will be positive tests, as we've seen. Small numbers, but there will be positive tests. I don't know. Um, I don't know how that's going to look. I'm not sure how they're going to figure that out. Uh, speaking of news in and around this planet, uh, what sounder would you give for something that's 20 minutes old? 20 minutes old would qualify as this. <laughs> Alex Kirkland at ESPN. La Liga will restart on June 11. Spain's National Sports Council has confirmed, three months after the COVID-19 pandemic forced the suspension, the announcement comes after Spain's government authorized the return of competitive sport in the country from June 8. So official date now, June 11 for La Liga. I think that was pretty much official before, but you just got another sign-off now. So nothing's changed in Spain after the initial plans. Uh Javier Tebas, the, the president of La Liga, the first and second division, they're combined. Um, this was last night. He said, we'll restart if God allows on June 11. We're hoping that Madrid and Barcelona pass into phase two. That's the, of the lockout de-escalation plan. Uh, and he said, which is where we can play. So I wonder if they're going to play all the games in Madrid and Barcelona. Stay tuned on that. That had not been said before. Uh, Tebas also said we'll start next season on September 12th. Um, the season would run June 11 until like mid July teams that are still alive in, in champions league and Europa league would play in August. That's still the plan that UEFA has. Uh, Tabas also talked about the, the TV presentation. He said, tonight we have audiovisual tests so that the viewer can choose two images, the real one and one with a virtual crowd and crowd noise. We want to give the choice to the fans silence or a simulation of the crowds. The tests I've seen are interesting and really catch your eye, but there will be two options. So they're not going to have one feed and that's it. They're going to give viewers the options like you do with the Sky broadcasts in Germany. Fox has opted to take that simulated crowd noise feed when it is available. But Germany offers the option, at least the Sky network does. Matches played behind closed doors following the strict safety protocol prepared by La Liga, approved by the Ministry of Health. Authorities have not formally ruled out the possibility of some fans attending early next season. 
matches every day for over a month as they're trying to get everything done by July 19. 11 rounds of fixtures needed to complete the 1920 campaign. A majority of the matches are going to be played either at 7.30 or 10 o'clock local time in the evening to avoid the highest midday temperatures. Yeah, it's typical. They do a lot of later games in, in Spain, so even without the temperatures, they'll do that. Uh, a couple other updates from different countries before we wrap up with your tweets. Uh, if you got any questions, comments, throw them at us at Soccer Down Here or on our, our Twitch channel if you're watching there, twitch.tv slash Soccer Down Here. Uh, here we go. We talked about CONCACAF and Panama. A couple other elements of that. The U-20 Women's World Cup was supposed to be in Panama and Costa Rica this year in August. Uh, that's not going to happen. It's going to be possibly the, the three options that are on the table, or at least that were considered at one point, November of this year, January to February of 21, or August of 21, and it's looking more like August of 21. Uh, FIFA is planning a meeting to define the competition calendar for 2021, and that tournament should be in it. World Cup qualifiers should be in it. You'd have the the Euros in it. You'd have Copa America in it. You'd have a Gold Cup in it. Uh, you got a lot of things in that FIFA calendar that they're going to have to create. India has started to f- try to figure out what things look like for them. Um, they suspended all major footballing tournaments, youth leagues, everything on March 15th. They are hopeful that the season can restart in October. The Ministry of Sports has given us guidelines on training and has allowed sports to resume without spectators, but I believe that team sports and contact sports will take some time to resume. We have the U-17 Women's World Cup in February of 21, and we would like to start training as soon as possible. Then we have AFC, Asian Football Confederation, U-16 Championship in September, but AFC has not yet postponed the dates, but I am hopeful they will do it. The The Indian season typically starts in September. This is all from All India Football Federation uh, General Secretary Kushal Das. He is uh, heading up the, the Indian Federation. Um they usually start in September, so it's not too weird. You just lost all the summer things that they typically do. Uh, he's hoping that they start by October, just a little bit late. India is set to participate in that U-17 Women's World Cup in February of 21 as the host nation. Uh, das is confident that all five venues will be ready by February of 21. He's worried about the preparation of the team, Um they, they haven't been able to do anything, obviously, travel restrictions, everything. Their coach is Swedish, uh, not in India right now. They hope they can start a training camp in September for that. They might try to host a competition, inviting some foreign teams in to prepare. But February of 21 is the U-17 Women's World Cup. India set to host. They think they're going to be okay with it. We'll see if that happens. Uh, in South America, Paraguay. They have their plan to resume play. July 17 is when they're coming back. Testing will take place between June 5th to 7th. Individual training will start on June 10 for players that are are clear to go. Group training June 16. Team training June 22. Games July 17 behind closed doors. That is Paraguay. Poland will allow 25% of stadiums to be filled four games after June 19th. That is their plan moving forward. Switzerland is looking to resume on June 19th. That's going to be a busy weekend. Uh, The Swiss Super League will be back. They had a vote, 20 teams, one abstained, two were against it, 17 voted for it. In Russia, they're starting that same weekend. Looks like the league's going to return June 21st. Stadiums will be allowed from the start to fill 10% of their capacity. That's from the Moscow Times. Um. In France, there was this back and forth about maybe they would start to play again now that the government has kind of backed off of some of its restrictions. Forget it. Ain't happening. Uh, Edouard Philippe, he uh, is, is, I think, with the Federation of Sport in France. He has said it's not going to happen. Uh, no question to even consider a restart of the season. Uh, next season set to plan in, or set to start in August. Scotland, uh, Stephen McGowan, Daily Mail. Today, the Scottish Football Federation and the leagues 
are set to present a plan to the government to prepare, to start the new premiership season behind closed doors on August 1st. That August 1st date has been drawn up to meet the terms of a new 125 million pound five-year broadcasting contract with Sky Sports. Uh, Ian Maxwell is the chief of the Scottish FA. Neil Doncaster, who we know very well, is the head of the SPFL. They're handing the proposal over to Health and Sports Minister Joe Fitzpatrick and National Clinical Director Jason Leach to get their project restart up and running. Uh, Players and officials tested twice a week. Typical clubs following a program of socially distanced and individual training before building up the smaller groups and then full team training. Again, we kind of have this established now. I think there is a clear blueprint to how to come back. Uh, the An SFA, that's the Scottish Federation source, told Sports Mail last night, the important thing to stress is that the six- to eight-week plan is movable. If the government say August 1st is too soon, then the plan still remains the same. Naturally, the SPFL want to resume playing on August 1 when the Sky deal kicks in, but the plan is the most important part. And they say if everything goes well with the Scottish Premiership, if the Sky Sports deal is good, if there's no rise in infections, then the Scottish Championship, the second division, could resume in October with an 18-game season. That is different. That is a home and away with 10 teams. That's it. That's an 18-game season when they typically play 38-39. Keep that in mind. The future of Scotland's League 1 and League 2 is unclear. Uh, Clubs are not likely to have any gate income until 2021 in Scotland. They were informed uh, earlier this week that testing protocols for players, staff, and officials would cost between 3000 and 5000 pounds per club per week, which is pretty typical from what we've seen you know, from day one with this. So League 1, League 2, who knows? They might not come back until they can have fans in the stands. Championship set to resume in October if things go well with the Premiership and it starts in on August 1, and it would be a reduced schedule in the Championship. And the Premiership would be what it is, uh, August 1 with a new TV deal, and that's kind of driving the conversation there. Uh, here in the U.S., a couple things real quick. Uh, there is a House bill in the Ohio House proposing defunding hundreds of millions of planned state construction projects. Cincinnati Stadium and Columbus Stadium are part of this. Uh, according to Senator Matt Dolan, this would save around 11 to $13 million because the state borrows money to pay for these projects, and it pays it off over 20 years or so. So it's, you know, cutting $500 million in projects doesn't actually save $500 million. It only saves about 11 or $13. Uh, $20 million to help build the new stadium for Columbus. $4 million to help build the stadium for Cincinnati alongside things like the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, uh, Playhouse Square in Cleveland, Cleveland Museum of Art. All those things are at risk of being defunded by the Ohio uh, House and the Ohio state government. And there's a little bit more on the LAFC stadium naming rights uh, in Variety, who's been all over this. Bank of California is restructuring under new leadership and new... Uh, priorities and the way that they're running their business that led to this. They think they're going to save obviously 60 something million dollars uh, over time because they're not going to pay out the hundred million dollar deal. They had to pay a penalty fee to get out of it. Now uh, some experts in the sponsorship world thought that LAFC could get around $7 million a year for the sponsorship rights to the stadium, which would mean that they would make a bunch of money up front to, you know, mitigate some of the losses from lack of ticket sales this year and still get their naming right sponsorship back in place and not really lose much. So things could work out really well for LAFC in this. I still think it is a big time net positive that this has gone down the way it has because they sold bank of California on plans. Now you have a a thriving team. You have a team that was, you know, recently sold, part of its ownership for a combined valuation of the club at $700 million, which is a record in the league. 
Uh, you have a real place. You're not selling a piece of paper with a drawing. You're selling a real venue and a title sponsorship. So I think they'll end up being really good because of all of this. I think LAFC is just fine. A couple of other things that I saw around the world before we go. Uh, Serbia, uh, they are not going to have any relegation, as we've talked about previously on the show. They kick off in five minutes, by the way. So their season restarts in five minutes' time. There will be no relegation in the Serbian League. Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, we were talking about Cruz Azul in, in hour number one and with mm-hmm. Mike. A lot of folks are sitting there and pointing at Article 66 of the uh, the Federation bylaws that says that Cruz Azul can be disenrolled if these allegations are proven with uh, the, the front office folks at Cruz Azul. And I thought that was interesting. I don't quite see it happening. But nevertheless, a lot of uh, money folks are laundering sitting and links to organized crime. If money is being laundered through Cruz Azul as a soccer club, yeah, I could see it happen. Okay. Don't know if that's the case, but yeah, I could see that happening. If you're having a club be part of money laundering, uh, it's going to be difficult to deal with. Uh, club America has announced their first round of testing results. Forty nine of fifty four have uh, tested negative, and they're still waiting for. Five results from other folks who have been tested um, in England. Uh, in the championship, the word from the Daily Mail is that clubs are looking for monetary help to secure all the testing that they would need for their players as they're gearing for a June 20 return. And Darby County players, according to our friends at The Telegraph, have agreed to a 35% wage deferral for the next two months to make sure that uh, Darby can meet all of their financial obligations. Mike McGrath at the Telegraph, uh, before it goes behind a paywall, says that the uh, uh, the 35% deferral for the next two months after talks where they question their legal rights in the event of not being paid any salary, the championship negotiated reductions a month ago reopened talks on the eve of paying their staff on Friday as they're looking to ease financial pressures during the pandemic. First-team players had their concerns answered by their PFA reps, who also asked which players would be willing to take the deferral with a neutral stance on whether to accept. Uh, Troy Deeney, in an interview with CNN, says that the Premier League title will be sullied despite everything that has gone on this year. He says, I believe that when it comes to the integrity of this season anyway, it's already gone. I feel sorry for Liverpool because no matter how it plays out, they deserve to win the league. They deserve to get the trophy, but no matter how it plays out, even if we play all the games, it's still going to be the year spoiled by the pandemic. It's not going to be that year that Liverpool won the league being the best team. And, you know, it's 30 years they haven't won for. So I do feel sorry for Liverpool and their players and Jordan Henderson but in terms of integrity, there's no way you could say that this is a viable competition. I completely and utterly disagree with what Troy Deeney's saying right there. Um, for Liverpool fans, they will remember this very fondly and all will be well. For others, uh, yeah, they might point at things. And yeah, this is going to be a season it's remembered. It's going to be remembered for other things. It's not going to be remembered only for Liverpool's season, but it's been an incredible season and it does not sully it in any way at all. I think that is 100% incorrect. Um, What Liverpool has done, and they need six points, they need two wins, um, they're fine. They're going to win the title. They would have won the title anyway. It does not sully it at all. I, I is it going to maybe not be remembered in the same way? 100%. This is something that we've never seen. And when we think back to sports and, and the 19 or the 2019, uh, 2020 seasons, we're going to remember that it was stopped. We're going to remember that games were played behind closed doors. We're going to remember all those things, but let's, be real do we remember that 1995 atlanta braves world series was not a 162 game season i forgot that i completely forgot that i didn't even think about it when it comes up until very recently you'll you'll forget some of the weird elements of it liverpool will go down as the champion it will not be sullied in any way I, i don't even know why that's coming up at this point and um, maybe that was not the intention of the comment, but yeah, I don't think that's even needed at this point. 
Yeah, Louise Taylor at The Guardian says that League One may now have to wait until June 8th before they come up with a decision at the end of their uh, about the end of their season. They've got it faster. Why? What is the wait? Uh, they according to Louise Taylor, uh, EFL clubs meeting on June 8th with the intention of approving the league's new mechanism for ending a campaign early in the event of the pandemic, ruling out the possibility of a normal conclusion. Shortly after this framework is approved, possibly a day or so later, League One clubs will then be able to vote. So, no reason given as to why there's a wait. It's just that there's a wait. No, there was a reason given about approving the procedure for ending the season. And then they can vote on ending the season. There, there's still no reason why they can't move these things up and get them done. League Two just said, we're not doing it. Yeah. Uh, they need to make a decision. And... I don't think there's any justification financially for finishing the season for League One. I just don't. I don't at all. Uh, a couple questions, uh, Turner, on Twitch. Will Champions League and Europa League be completed within the time frame between the domestic season's ending and the new season starting? That's the plan. The, the plan, and I think UEFA hoped that it would all line up this way. It might not, ultimately for domestic seasons to be done by the end of July, the remaining games in Champions League, Europa League, to be played in August, finals at the end of August, and then season starting fairly quickly. Some are talking about September. This is where it gets confusing with Scotland talking about August 1st. And, okay, how are you going to make all that work? Because Rangers will be playing... UA or Europa, Europa League games for the current season that would then be the previous season when they start their new season, but they would also be playing Europa League qualifying games immediately after that for the next campaign. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I think UEFA is going to have to at their meeting where they determine the the Champions League and and schedules and all that for Europa League, the new Europa Conference League, all that stuff. I don't know if they can tell leagues to hold off starting, but I think they should. Um, It shouldn't be August 1 for Scotland. It should be September 1 at the earliest, and we'll see. The plan is, though, for seasons to finish. And if they get pushed back and you have some overlap, you have some overlap. That's I, I think basically UEFA expected that could be a possibility, so they created a little bit of buffer. They'd like to have every season done by the end of July, play the, the remainder of Champions League and Europa League in August, start the next campaigns in September. And it's going to start with qualifying for Champions League, Europa League, Conference League, all that stuff. Uh, it's going to be hard with all the international travel, with all the financial challenges for some of the smaller teams in these qualifying rounds. Uh, they might not look like we've ever seen them look, but that's where we're at. Uh, how long do you think it'll take for a Last Dance-esque documentary about sports and COVID-19 to be done? Wow. Um, I'd give it a year. But that means that you'd have to start working on it right now while things well, are going you need on. To start working on it, but I don't think you can tell the story in a year. I think you're probably looking at telling the story in five years, to be honest. I mean, like the, the thing about The Last Dance that I think was so brilliant about it, everybody initially, and this is what they sold it on, was we've got all this footage. We, we've got all this behind the scenes footage that nobody's seen, but it's what you do with it. Mm-hmm. And the Maradona documentary is the same thing. I mean, it was done with, you know, footage from a long time ago that then they repackaged and put interviews on top of it, people looking back at that time. And I I know in that case, they wish they had been able to have more of Maradona talking about it, but the comments that you did get from him were incredibly powerful. Just like in The Last Dance, the comments from Jordan looking back at things was incredibly powerful. I don't think you can really tell that story that quickly. I think you're going to need to get to like five years down the road, because you don't want it to be as long after the fact as Last Dance and, and right. Maradona was, but you can't reflect. Like, I mean, I can tell you the story about how crazy it was being at the Estadio Azteca as all this was falling apart, right. but that's an immediate, you know, just this happened. This was crazy. I don't know what it means in the grand context of things yet. I don't, I don't know. Um, I don't know what this is going to end up meaning in the grand scheme of things just yet. 
I think it'll happen for sure. I think it'll happen on everybody who does anything with sports content will be doing things about it. But I think the best pieces will be done five, ten years down the road where you can really reflect on it and look back at the impact it's had. Agree. Uh, Stizzle A on Twitter. And I have a kicker before we go. Uh, if San Jose is the lone team that's not allowed to practice in their own surroundings, can't they be moved to an out-of-state site that does allow it? If yeah. Wide World of Sports is ready, let them get settled in there. Yeah, and I think that was thought of the part of the, the thought process. So um, I had heard San Jose could be looking at possibly playing in a different or training in a different place anyway. Uh, they're the only ones left now. They also do have some things that, they're worried about that have nothing to do with this uh their assistant coach uh, benjamin galindo um, was hospitalized in guadalajara this was yesterday or the day before uh reportedly had a stroke had to undergo some pretty serious surgery uh his son gave a statement and said that things looked good um but we'll have to wait and see uh galindo's a legendary player and and matias almeida's assistant with the quakes so uh, they are, as everybody in MLS is, is hoping that things go well and, and Benjamin makes a, a full recovery, they've probably been a little distracted. So uh, that's going to be part of this issue. But, yeah, you're going to have to figure out getting San Jose into a place where they can start the protocol training. And, and that's, I think, how you have to look at this. The individual training or the individual group training, like you're talking about now, that's – the way to look at it it's not traditional group training it's not something we've seen any other league do it's a step forward but still in the individual training phase either way and and san jose can jump straight into that that's fine but you need to get them on board with that as much as anything to establish the protocols of showing up and doing the right things that you're being asked to do uh, following the guidelines just getting into the routine of it before you move on to the testing that will be required for the the small group training with contact from there it moves fast and there was as we're seeing a lot of times right now i mean i think there's a lot of you know incomplete information being shared and and a lot of people trying to take shots at things because it's the the cool thing to do it doesn't have to move slow once it gets to that point. There's nothing from a medical perspective about the difference between going from a small group session to a full team training session as long as the testing is involved. Yes, you're going to be interacting with more people. You're honestly probably going to be interacting with more people for less period of time in those training sessions, in a full team training session. The amount of time you're around somebody is what increases the possible spread if that person is positive. You're doing the testing to ensure that they're not positive in the absolute case of crazy amount of false testing, which, hey, anything can happen. You're trying to limit being around the same people for an extended period of time. There's no difference like going from a week of small group training with contact to then the next week doing full team training. It doesn't matter. I think it's all about ramping up, establishing protocols and getting players in the routine of it. It's the testing. 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 That's what it comes down to. So that's what it's going to take. The Quakes need to get to step one of the individual, whether it is truly individual, whether it is individual group like we're about to see. It's still individual. There's still no interaction. There's still no contact. There's still no full team training. There's still no traditional small group training going on right now or starting next week for MLS. San Jose can jump straight into that. You have to get them there before you can move on to the next. If you can follow a timeline roughly, you got to get everything approved. You got to get everybody on the same page. You got to get all the money right. You got to get all the plans right. You got to get all the scheduling right with the Orlando idea. Or if you change it up and you do something else, you got to you got to get all that right first. But let's say you do. Let's say you get that over the weekend and you start to create your roadmap. Your roadmap, in my opinion, is very simple. You get San Jose training somewhere. That's step one. I'm sure they've got plan B's and C's and D's near their market. And I'm sure that if Orlando is where everybody's going to be, I think this has already been reported, that they could go early and go there and train and do what they got to do. Okay. Get that solved. 
from there, it is testing 72 hours, roughly, and that's what most have done. 72 hours is the guideline I would use from what we know. 72 hours prior to the start of contact small group training. Testing for everybody. Testing for everybody that would be involved at that stage. And that's probably going to be all your players. That's going to be all your technical staff. That's going to be any other team personnel that are going to be involved in those training sessions. Done. You do that. You start at 72 hours before you're going to initialize that contact group training. You're good. Anybody who tests positive, they're held out. Okay. That's that. A week after that, you can start your full team training. You're doing all your testing along the way. Once you get to that point, you know, let's say you do your your 72-hour testing starting next week, and it can be part of the individual training. It can be something the clubs organize at their training facilities in a perfect world um, or at a you know nearby facility. Uh, you know, we see all Premier League teams do drive-through testing at that point at their facility Whatever you can do in your market, you do that. Let's say you start that Friday, if we're just working from the calendar right now. You do your testing. Everybody has to have their testing done by Sunday, next week. Okay. You can start your small group training in market on the 8th, if we're going to go Monday or the 8th. Okay, you're going to do a week of small group training. You're going to do two tests within that time. And you're going to start your full team training on the 15th. Okay. You're going to do two weeks of full team training. And it could be where there's a week in market and a week in Orlando. That's possible. And then you're doing two tests a week during that time. And then you get ready to play games. That would put you on a timeline that is comfortable from a protocol standpoint that I think we've seen modeled in other leagues that would allow you to play at the beginning of July. And I, I think you're good with all of that. There's nothing to fear in, in any of that right now. I think you're you're really good to get that done. But you're going to do, before you play a game, you're going to do, in a perfect world, you do two tests in that 72 hours before you start training. So two tests then. You do two tests the week of the small group sessions. You do two tests the first week of team training. You do two tests... The second week of team training, you do another test 24 hours before the game. You're doing, what did I say, nine tests? Nine. You're doing nine tests before you hit the field for a match. And you're probably, by the time you get to team training, you're going to ramp up some of your testing, as we saw the Premier League go from 50 to 60 per test. You're probably going to then include communication staff. You're probably going to then include any other team personnel that would be involved in matches that are not involved in training. So then they would get their testing. You would have your referees start their testing at that point. You would have any broadcasters who would be on site, crew, camera, whatever is going to be in the stadium, they start their testing two weeks before games get played. That seems like, from what we've seen in the Bundesliga, what we've seen with others, that is the reasonable way forward. And you're you're on a pathway to start playing in the beginning of July. There's nothing that is is difficult about that right now. Does that seem reasonable? I mean, does that seem like no. the, the way forward? I think from what yeah. we've learned during all this, that seems like the way the way to go. Yeah, no, I'm I'm with you in all of that process. I mean, for me, I would always want to add even more testing if it you know if it can be made available. But once again, you get into the financial component. But I think I don't the nine. Know t- if it's I, necessary. I I, I mean. I admit I'm erring on the side of caution. I know it. Yeah, I mean, I guess you'd be testing every day. But if you, and there's an if there, because we're talking adults. We're we're talking, you know, pro athletes. We're talking, you know, adults with a technical staff. Uh, Hopefully nobody makes a runner for toothpaste and face cream. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you're, you're asking people to be responsible with their own time as well, especially in this scenario, in market, and, you know, if, if people can do that and you're doing two tests a week, you should be fine. Um, 
I don't see it being realistic for everybody to test every day. I just don't think that's a, a realistic expectation. I think two tests a week is doable. I don't know if you need more. I don't know if three ramps up the, the safety level. You know what I mean? I don't know if that yeah. makes a demonstrable difference. Yeah. No, I mean, I, that to me is just the, the option of every other day in theory in a week's time. That's how I'm looking at it. Yeah, I, but then you start figuring out, like, okay, how much more security does that give you in the testing results you're getting versus the cost? I don't know if there's a, a an effectiveness there. Right. You know, I, I think we're seeing in the Bundesliga, two is working well. I think in England we're seeing that two is identifying things very well. I think two is the way to go every, you know, three to four days. That seems to be the right way to go. And, you know... I mean, it does come down to cost. It does come down to being, you know, efficient with with the financials. There's a lot of elements that come into play here, but that would be nine tests before you'd play a game that you'd have to, you know, be cleared on to, to go forward. I think you're you're ensuring a lot of safety with that. Yeah. Uh, the last thing I had on my sheet. Did you hear about? The Diego Maradona Museum. Uh, where? At his old house, his teenage home in Buenos Aires. Um, I think I heard something about that. That would have been the the place that Argentinos Juniors bought for him, I guess. Unless he, mm-hmm. unless it's what he bought after that when he uh, started making some decent money. I don't. I'm not sure. It, it was the one that was given to him as a part of that first contract. Okay. It has now been turned into a museum made to look like how he would have been living back in 1978. Yeah, that's cool. 2016, the home opened up as a shrine thanks to Alberto Perez, a former Argentinos junior manager who collects Maradona memorabilia. He bought the house for around 82,000 pounds in 2008 off a woman who'd lived there since 1981 when Maradona departed for Boca Juniors. In a bid for authenticity, Perez has painstakingly replicated Maradona's old home with the same furnishings and household items, including a trusted record player he listened to in his room, as well as a piano he liked playing. Yeah, Diego's a big music fan. Um, he loves to sing. He loves to dance. So he, you've got lots of musical elements with Diego Maradona. Um, not surprised he had a piano. Uh, I'd, I'd like to see Diego and, and Jordan have a piano duel off. That would be fun. <laughs> Uh, unseen photos of Maradona, his first contract with Argentinos Juniors, as well as a deed to the property in his dad, Don Diego's name. And there are... Uh, photographs and uh, Alberto Perez's son Cesar says in the pictures you can see how happy he was this is a work of the heart a living tribute to the best player of all time if you want to look at the photos they are in an article that is involved in that three letter newspaper whose name we don't say yeah we don't talk about that Uh, that'd be pretty cool I would and I wonder because Diego pays attention to this stuff I wonder if Diego has heard about the last dance seen the the last dance idea had seen the reaction to jordan and thought about maybe doing something like that he's given yeah. interviews like jordan i think one of the things about the last dance was jordan hadn't really given you those kinds of glimpses into his life like he did here you know it was he, he hasn't been a very outspoken guy he hasn't been a guy who was always talking to the media well diego has but if you could do some of the things that you did in the last dance uh, with Diego, where like you get interviews from people talking about him or talking about games or talking about things that happen, hand Diego an iPad and let him react to it. Oh yes. my God, that would be amazing. <laughs> you, you give him, you give him the the referee from the nineteen ninety final who Diego still hates to this day. You get him and ask him about the decisions he made in that game, and then hand the iPad over to Diego. Oh man. Uh, you think the amount of four-letter <laughs> words that were dropped on ESPN during the last dance were loud? Phew, you're going to get all kinds of stuff said from Diego. He's going to, you know, invent insults and, and oh, curse words, and awesome. it'll be ridiculous. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping this happens. Stay, say, come on, get on it, please. 
find a way to convince Diego to do this. It'd be awesome. I know you got the footage. You did like 10 hours of Uh Diego Maradona footage. So you've got tons of footage to work with here. Just get the interview, start lining the interviews up with people to talk about different games, different moments, and then just have Diego respond to it. That'd be amazing. So, so your Michael Jordan, Gary Payton on the iPad. He's got a uh, million Gary moment. Paytons. He's got That's he's fun. got more Gary Paytons than Michael Jordan's got Gary Paytons. I mean, if you've read anything from Diego, everybody just like Jordan, everybody who ever said anything, thought anything, he thought thought something did anything to cross him, uh, Diego will hold it against that person. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah. Like he's got a ton of those. Um, there's not one. There's not just one. It's that referee from the '90 final. Um, I'm sure there's players from England who said things about the '86 match that that he would go in on. I mean, you can just name it. The the guy who broke his ankle in La Liga, uh, Goy Cochea from Athletic Bilbao. He would have a lot of things to say about him. Uh, previous managers, uh, everybody. Diego would would light everybody up and it'd be entertaining and sad and funny and a little disturbing and all of that wrapped into one amazing i, I went through ama- a bunch of synonyms so we're, we're good we covered it <laughs> i don't know if unbelievable it. incredible no no, no stop, stop great television no 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 all right that's all i got on my list what about you uh i think that's it um According to Sky Sports, Brendan Rogers has said that he had coronavirus. He's now recovered. Him um, and his wife tested positive early on during all of this, uh, recovered, um, displayed symptoms. And did he say when? Um, he said, me and my wife had it just after uh, the season broke up. A week later, I really started to struggle. I had no smell and no taste. I had no strength, and I really struggled. My wife was the same as well got tested and we both had it i could hardly walk it reminded me of climbing mount kilimanjaro as you climb higher you get more breathless walking 10 yards felt very different i went for a run and i just couldn't do it i felt really weak had no real appetite and a weird sensation for three weeks of having no taste uh that was i mean that would have been mid to late march that he was going through that and that nobody really said anything about it um, he didn't, you know, make it clear at that point, and nobody, you know, found out about it until now. So uh, that's a pretty good glimpse uh, at what it can do. Um, haven't heard much of that from managers and players in the game. So that's the reality, folks. That's the reality of what we're dealing with here, and that's why all these protocols and safety measures are in place. Uh, they're weird and different and there's things we're not used to that we have to do right now to be safe but do them please and and do what you need to do to take care of yourself and take care of the people around you um just don't get blinded by its silliness and posturing and and anger and all that just do what you got to do to take care of yourself and the people around you uh this world's a kind of scary place right now on a lot of fronts and I didn't know if we'd be still be doing a show at this point because I didn't really feel like doing a show this morning after everything that's been going on in this country. But uh, we are, and hopefully it was a good distraction for people for a while. It was for me, and I hope it was for others. And just take care of each other, please, and take care of the people around you and especially the people who need that help more than, than you do. So we'll be back uh, maybe over the weekend if there's stuff going on. There's going to be games from Germany on the Fox networks that you can watch. Uh, there will be games from Costa Rica. Does ESPN Deportes have a match this weekend? I do not believe so. Okay. Uh, there's other games popping up. Uh, Derek Ray posted more on the Frauen Bundesliga, the women's league in Germany, and their schedule. So a lot of different things in the soccer world to watch and it's only going to increase as we go maybe we'll get an mls announcement maybe we'll at least get some more leaks if the athletic can keep doing their thing uh we'll see if the league can stop that from happening but we'll have plenty to talk about when we get back together on monday so y'all have a good weekend mucha platio amen mucha platio